Good morning, Carroll County. It's uh, Commissioner Ed Rothstein. It is Thursday, March 4th, and we're beginning our open session uh, for this morning. As we do uh, at all open sessions, let's rise for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. And then just take a moment and uh, pause, thank those that are uh, continuing to be in harm's way. Uh, continue to praise and give strength and courage to those uh, you know that are serving uh, selflessly, whether they are in uh, blue, red, green, health care workers, taking care of our community and neighbors. And again, that's just my, my opening thoughts. So let's rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. I'll tell you, I love that pledge. <laughs> um, okay, let's start with uh, Priority Carol. Um, Commissioner Wants, go for it. Wow, I'm out of the gate this morning. You're out of the gate. All right, <clears throat> let's start with uh, first of all. Good morning, everyone, and uh, I hope everyone is is well. We're going to hear a, uh, which I think you'll probably expand on, Commissioner Rostein, but we're going to hear another press conference this afternoon at one thirty about vaccine equity. Interesting topic. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, I listened to Mayor Brandon Scott this morning. Uh, he had a live uh, on-air um, event with uh, WBAL Radio, and he had a lot of interesting things to say, but I won't go there right now. Um, but we'll hear more about vaccine equity, which which is, is sorely needed, and we'll, we'll see what plan they have. A uh, couple positive things that are occurring in Carroll. Uh, the, BE, the BGE Emergency Response and Safety mm -hmm. Grant uh, came out, and uh, it's always been my honor to attend those in person. I've been doing it for the last, gosh, six six years now. I actually was there before I was commissioner. Um, I continue to encourage folks to put in for these grants. Uh, they're very important, and uh, they go a long way in helping uh, a lot of a lot of our nonprofits and fire departments uh, get the much needed equipment that uh, they can't afford on a regular basis. So happy to inform everybody that we have uh, six recipients this year. Uh, I don't have dollar amounts but i know the arc of carroll uh is receiving um a grant the pleasant valley community fire company you all have heard that little place i think probably <laughs> a few times uh reese fire company sykesville uh mm -hmm. fire company westminster and winfield so i applaud the fire companies for putting in for these yep. and um i also want to thank bge and their partners exelon etc for allowing uh that to occur good stuff Always like uh, money coming into to Carroll. Uh, this afternoon, I will be uh, taking uh, the next step with uh, the Chesapeake Connect that I'm uh, involved with as a representative of Carroll to the Baltimore Metropolitan Council. As a result of the Chesapeake Connect trip not <laughs> happening, they're doing podcasts. There's a link on our website for that. And the new podcast will be me. All right. <laughs> All kinds of applause. Uh, wait, wait. I said all I right. I uh, okay, that's good. Uh, but I have hey, the opportunity. It's the golf clap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have the opportunity today to uh, to to speak with my uh, good friend Don Fry, uh, mm -hmm. who is uh, who is the uh, president and CEO of the uh, Greater Baltimore Committee, and uh, Don and I will be bantering back and forth this afternoon, and that will be on our website probably the, the beginning of next week. But if you haven't tuned into that yet. Mm -hmm. uh, let's be clear. I turned the television on last night. There's nothing on TV. Nothing. <laughs> They're all repeats. There's nothing on. Football's over. <laughs> so turn the TV off. Go to our website. Listen to the BMC podcast. And Don Fry is top 100 in the daily record. So he is, yeah. uh, so, he is yeah. a standout. Exactly. Absolutely. So, um, <laughs> the only other thing I have, and uh, Commissioner Rothstein, I know you're uh, in tune with this as well. Uh, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., uh, the the state will will pause mm -hmm. to pay tribute uh, to the fact that it's been one year uh, that we've been battling uh, this this. I know it yeah. seems unbelievable, 
Uh, and we're not done battling yet, by the way. Uh, but anyway, more to come on that. But uh, tomorrow evening uh, at 5, uh, the governor, the first lady, the lieutenant governor, uh, our Senate president, House speaker, uh, some clergy and, uh, and, and other folks will pause at 6 p.m. at the government house in the state house dome. Uh, <clears throat> and they will be lighting up the dome okay. with amber lights. And they have asked all jurisdictions in the state uh, to, to, to that as well. So I want to give a shout out to uh, Chris Weinbrenner, who's been working with our facilities folks. We're trying to get the amber lights for here, <laughs> working on it. Uh, and it's in the mail. It's in the mail. So <laughs> if, if that occurs, uh, I, I encourage everyone to, uh, to, to, to take notice to that. Uh, but also, I would ask that beginning at du dusk tomorrow evening, which is about 6.05-ish, uh, that we uh, – everyone pause for a moment of silence. Uh, it, this is – I think this is really important, and I applaud the governor for taking the steps to do that. Uh, this, this battle hasn't been easy. It's been a huge challenge for everybody. It continues to be. Uh, I know that none of us now have, have not been touched by this, by this pandemic. Uh, I lost a very dear friend in my uh, first responder community, and, uh, you know, it, it just uh, – we, we cannot forget. So uh, take a moment tomorrow evening at 6.05. Uh, we're attempting here to do our best to get the uh, 225 North Center lit up in the way it should be. Uh, but most importantly, pause at 6.05 just to reflect on where we are, where we've been, and where we're going. Uh, one last thing for Priority Carol for me, we had a very interesting planning and zoning committee uh, meeting, a uh, work session last night. Uh, the importance, again, of, of our involvement as a board of county commissioners, because I know this has come into question, uh, is, is off the charts. Uh, last night, uh, they're working on the solar mm -hmm. for, for the county, and you, you, you all know that we've been looking at ag remainders and what have you. I can tell you that last night was – incredible conversation by the members of our planning and zoning board uh also our staff uh brenda din was on there tom devilbiss was on there uh jay voigt was on there i'm going to miss some folks and, and of course linda mm -hmm. uh, who leads that charge uh, eisenberg but really great conversation and we really need to begin to pay attention here to what is happening with solar and what's going to happen with that and I'll give you an example. Last evening, one of the solar folks were on there because they allow public comment on there. And uh, his response, and I don't, don't quote me, but uh, we really want to be able to come in there and tell you where to put your solar. <laughs> okay? Which, which threw up flags. Right. Uh, whistles went off. I fell off my chair. Tom Devilbiss, I think, is still on the floor. Um, <laughs> But uh, the, the point of the matter is this is a really important uh, mm -hmm. topic that sets the future of Carol and where these things are going to be. Uh, the ugliness of them came up because it always does. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it, it's a very interesting mm -hmm. topic. So I want to applaud. Uh, the, it's the perfect example of good government in work when you've got these boards working. And uh, gosh, I sure am glad I was on there last night to give the – the, the right. you know the the yeah. aspect of sure. what we yeah. as the board of commissioners yeah. will anticipate uh, from the work that our planning and zoning board is doing. So, shout out to them. More work to come. It's not ready for prime time yet, but we're getting there. And I'll tell you, just um, also, not to be you know we want to be able to tell our story and not have the state right. yep. come down with additional legislation. So, the importance of getting our story out and. Um, the other thing, people are watching, people yeah. are listening. Developers and yeah. builders are seeing what we're going to be doing with solar. I was talking to a couple yesterday, as a matter of fact, and it, I didn't know you had the conversation last night, but we we're talking about solar. Yeah. So, yeah, well, the ag community was on there. The, the yep. president of the ag board was on there last night. We heard mm -hmm. from them. Uh, we're getting emails from our ag community. Very important. Uh, so it, it it's good. And, and Ed, you raise a great point because we're in the middle of the general assembly down there. I don't know about you guys. I don't want Annapolis telling us what to Absolutely. do in Carroll. Nope. Who knows better about what happens in Carroll? Absolutely. Oh, I know the answer to that. We do. <laughs> With that, thank you, Commissioner Rostein. Absolutely. The community of Carroll County knows better for what's 
best in Carroll County. Okay, Commissioner Weaver, you are up. Yeah, good morning. Um, good morning. Just a uh, comment here on the uh, solar. Uh, I know one company that already was hot and heavy in Carroll County. They pulled out when they found out they couldn't clear the forest to put their solar panels in uh, under our present uh, uh, proposal as it's in the present time. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot to talk about. And, uh, uh, you know, we have to do this and do it right for the county. And I, I believe that. Um, one thing I just want to mention, uh, you have a group over my end of the woods and up in your end of the woods, uh, Commissioner Wentz, uh, working to put an electronic sign at Manchester Valley High School. I think it's the only high school that doesn't have one in the county, and they have raised the money. They're paying for it, uh, going to put it up uh, for everything. And by the way, uh, as far as TV, the Big Ten Wrestling Conference, uh, uh, is on all weekend. It'll cover the whole thing throughout the weekend. So, uh, yes, it is. Good yeah, job, Weaver. Yeah, yeah good, <laughs> good TV all weekend. Um, now, Commissioner Fraser and I had the opportunity to uh, tour the uh, Veterans Independence Project here, and uh, I tell you, I've been familiar with Frank Valente and Ed Kramer for the last, I guess, five, six years. And they've worked hard to finally get a facility that they have as the Veterans Independent Project. It is beautiful uh, what they've put together, and uh, they spent a long time on it. They are, have an executive director now, and they are working to get some part-time uh, people in helping them with it. They have a day room that is uh, very nice. In fact, uh, very comfortable and well put together. And, uh, you know, they're hopefully to work with our uh, Veterans um, um, Advisory Council and put together the gaps, fill in some of the gaps there. We don't want duplication of that, uh, effort anywhere, but they are trying to fill in some of those areas, whether it's some job training or some skills out there that can happen. So I was really impressed to see what they've done. Uh, you know, depends on your numbers, but there's between – 12 and 14,000 uh, veterans in Carroll County and with at least 300 uh, disabled uh, veterans in Carroll County, maybe more, but it's hard to count people come and go, but that is definitely uh, uh, a good project and they work hard to get to this point. And I, I do give Frank and Ed a lot of credit. They've hung with us for years uh, and never quit, never gave up on the mission. So um, give those guys credit. The other thing is vaccines. I do out in the community talking to more, more and more people that are getting vaccinated, uh, at least coming up. It's starting to roll along a little better. I know we don't have enough and we can't go fast enough, but it is starting to get a little bit of momentum behind it. So um, I, I hope that can continue. I hope the governor can help us and everyone else along the line. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Weaver. Commissioner Fraser. Well, thank you. Um, I would say that, as Commissioner Weaver did mention about the Veterans Independent Project, we were there. <laughs> the difficult thing about that for me was finding the building <laughs> to my district. I, I drove around it once or twice, but I did find it, it and I won't go in. Ms. Commissioner Weaver did uh, you know, talk about it. it. It's a tremendous thing here in Carroll County. And he did check out the day room. I think he sat in all the chairs and leaned back and put his feet up. And so he <laughs> he checked it out thoroughly. So my guess is it was it was a good day room. So <laughs> I move on to expiration comments. I have some pictures here um, of expiration. I went in there uh, last last Friday. It is amazing how much work is done. Uh, they've got walls up, and really, you know, when we went in there before the walls were up, we looked around. It looks bigger now because now it's, it's divided up and you see all these uh, little uh, workspaces and, and stuff that they're going to do down there. It's moving forward. Everything looks great. I believe they're going to be opening uh, spring to summer area to have it open for the public to come in. They've had a, a delay or two because of weather and steel. I have to mention that. And, <laughs> but they're, they're moving forward very, very well. Everybody's very enthusiastic about it. And when this is all said and done, this will be the only place like this in the state of Maryland. It really will. The other uh, library systems from around the state have already asked to come in and see what, you know, when it's finished to see how it's going to be working and all. So this is a big, big plus, and it's right down in downtown Westminster. That's a great job. 
Also want to say that we had a uh, meeting of the opioid senior policy meeting uh, yesterday. Um, so they, they do a lot of good work, but one of the things that, that stood out for me was that the, uh, the problem with the opioids actually has gotten a little bit worse over the coronavirus uh, time. And one of the reasons pointed out is that the stimulus checks that, are, that have come out, it's extra money in people's hands that they weren't <laughs> expecting. And then they go back to the old habits. Oh, well, what can I do with this money? I have it to use something with it. Perhaps maybe they wouldn't have had, you know, if they didn't have the money, they wouldn't have that temptation. So that that's a, a I guess, a bad thing for the stimulus checks. But, you know, the, the opioid policy group is working. Uh, the sheriff's department is doing everything they can to keep everything in check. And we heard from Sheriff DeWeese during, during there. They're, they're still doing all the stuff that they're supposed to be doing and more. But this extra money coming in the community into the hands, it's just, it's just a big temptation, and it really is. But, you know, like I said, things are moving forward, and, and I applaud that group for everything they're doing, and I applaud, applaud the sheriff and everyone else involved with trying to keep this, you know, uh, in, in, in under control. Um, I would just want to say about the coronavirus numbers are heading in the right direction, but they're heading in the right direction. It's not over. It's not over. Wear the mask, social distance hand sanitate, you know, wash your hands, do all that stuff that we're supposed to do. But the numbers are trending down. I'm very, very hopeful. I hope, and I'd like yeah. to thank everyone else is as well. And that's about it. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, I think they're heading in the right directions because we are doing the right things. Um, it's interesting about the opioids because thinking through secondary tertiary effects of that stimulus money is, wow. Uh, that's, yeah. Uh, Commissioner Boucher. Good morning, Commissioners. Commissioner Frazier, thanks for those photos that you had there. Now we have the Sheriff's Farm, but thanks for the photos you put up of the library. It's really important for the public to see where all the resources are going. And uh, you can bring the photos back up, Mr. Swam. I did a tour of the Sheriff's Department training facility this week. There we go. <clears throat> Wonderful operation out there. The Sheriff had told us that he needed some expansion. I had been out there before, but went out a second time to see how well he's expanded. A lot of enthusiastic young men and women there. I think one class they said it was 50% female at one time. So it's good to see more females and a lot of law enforcement and their dedication. Uh, it's a tremendous operation they have out there. And I think it's important for the public to know what's going on and that our public safety is in good hands for a fair share. Uh, also, I'd like to mention that two weeks ago was the fourth anniversary of losing my daughter to the opioid epidemic. So I'm very grateful for commissioner Frazier being on top of this and making people aware that this is going on. It hasn't gone away. And uh, I've had uh, a business person in the County contact me about what they can do, where they can make donations. And I said, the best thing you can do is contact their citizen services department. Celine Steckler director is on top of it. She's close to the public. She knows what resources are needed out there and what nonprofits could use some donations. So if you are an individual who's in a financial position or a business and, and want to make some donations to reduce your taxable income, please contact our citizen services department and, and make some donations to these organizations. They can really use your help. And like Commissioner Frazier said, the numbers have gone up and for a whole variety of reasons, but it's their responsibility. And I think it, um, shows how compassionate and caring we are as a, a community for those who are in the, the, the addiction and the mental illness that they need help. So please remember those individuals. Also like to give mention to new employees of the county. Welcome aboard. I'll run down a list of some people that the county has hired. Caitlin Harvey, comprehensive planner. Deanne Coakley, office associate. Sarah Proneckiak, office associate. Amy Beal, traffic engineer. We also have a lot of contact, contractual employees that have come on board as park assistants at Piney Run, which I very much love. That's Kareen White, Reed Shoemaker, Eric Pools, David Watson Jr., Evan Simpson, Seller Oakley, Sarah McGetty, and Edward Devon. If I messed up anyone's name, my apology, but welcome aboard. It's wonderful having new employees and being part of the team. So thank you very much. Oh, before I go, I want to I mention the little ducky in front of Commissioner Lance. I, I had that put up there. Once again, there you go. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, there you go. We're advertising for Union Bridge. They're doing their duck derby again this year. It'll be May 22nd. Thank you, Commissioner. What's really important, I think, about this duck derby is last year was postponed 
and they were set it up to do a donation of some of the proceeds to suicide prevention in honor of Perry Jones the third. Perry Jones Jr.'s son had uh, suffered and had committed suicide last year. So this is a very important issue. I lost a stepson. I know his pain, having lost a stepson to it and having lost a daughter to addiction. So please support these organizations. We're trying to raise money for suicide awareness and help those people who are suffering from mental health issues. Thank you, Commissioner Wentz. Okay, uh, a few things. First, um, I do wanna give a shout out to a very close friend of mine. Uh, her name is uh, Karen Gibson. She's a retired Lieutenant General, and she is the only one I know that can be promoted from General to Sergeant, and she was just announced to be the Sergeant of Arms in the U.S. Senate, so that's pretty exciting. And uh, what's really cool about her, she is a cancer survivor and a poster child of resiliency and leadership, so shout out to her. Um, dealing with the vaccines, we did get a handful of more vaccines this week. Um, a few hundred Johnson & Johnson vaccines, which is the single dose, and a couple hundred more of uh, Moderna into our health department. We are still, and I don't wanna say woefully short, um, we are challenged with the numbers that we are getting to administer to the most vulnerable. We are continuing to stay in 1B, uh, which is 75 and over. Um, I uh, reach out to our administration, our state administration, to uh, <clears throat> share my very candid thoughts on how we can get more. Um, they are opening regional centers, which are good for the state as a community, but not necessarily for us here in Carroll okay. County. And just like Commissioner Wentz said, who knows Carroll County better than Carroll Countyans? Uh, so we'll continue to drive towards getting uh, more vaccines in the county. We will be having a town hall uh, webinar, uh, on Tuesday the 9th at 5 p.m. where I will be joined by our health department, uh, Mr. Ed Singer, to answer any questions and again, share our candid thoughts on moving forward where we are today and moving forward into the near future. I do applaud uh, the governor in recognizing the importance of Friday as we have gone through a year, um, you know, lighting up a building is a good thing. Um, but I'm not as enthused about, you know, the lights as I am about the efforts in um, uh, working hard to minimize the impact of this pandemic. So, uh, you know, continuing as leaders do lead by example, um, wear the mask, like Commissioner Fraser said, and social distance. You're in public buildings. You will be wearing a mask. We are starting to get more folks in public buildings by law and by doing what's right. Uh, which is called integrity, we will be wearing masks and keeping ourselves uh, as best we can in safe distance as we are here on the dais. Uh, again, it's hard to see. We have plexiglass between each of us and then another piece of plexiglass between, so it's like two pieces of plexiglass between each commissioner and uh, feeling comfortable that we're, we're, we're being as safe as we can. Um, let's see. Yeah, so the, the vaccine equity, the governor is gonna be talking. He is opening a couple more regional centers, highlighting one in the West in Hagerstown, but that's not scheduled to open until March 31st. Um, so I'm still very Carroll County centric and seeing how we can continue to highlight those that are uh, most vulnerable in getting sick here in Carroll County, working with the health department. I really applaud everything that they are doing. They're, they're amazing in their selfless efforts. Um, one of you mentioned about, uh, oh, uh, Manchester Valley um, sign. <clears throat> there are some things that, you know, the school or government can and will can and will pay for. There's other things that they cannot or would not pay for. And some of it's the playgrounds. And um, in Eldersburg, there is a Freedom Elementary School, a playground that is in uh, really rough shape. And uh, the PTA, and others and volunteers have started a GoFundMe page to raise the appropriate money to uh, build that playground. I really applaud the initiative of the neighbors and neighborhood and community rallying around in elementary school to raise the money necessary because that's how it's gonna get done. It's gonna get done through folks helping each other and putting a few dollars in. 
And I look forward to continuing to advocate uh, for that, find grants when they're available, uh, and continue to uh, share in, in the good work that they're doing. So uh, just keep that up. Um, okay, I think we are done uh, with Priority Carol. It was a relatively long one, but there's a lot of activity happening, and a lot of activity happening in our, in our great community. This conference um, will now be recorded. <clears throat> I'd like to hand it over to, I think Mr. Degas should be on for a recognition. Okay. And Jeff, why don't you take it from here? Thank you, Commissioner, and good morning. Uh, very happy to be joined this morning by two of our staff, and I'd like to ask them to uh, come into the meeting now. We have Matt Decker. Uh, Matt is the sports complex manager and he also works closely with the Charles Carroll Rec Council. And we have Becky Kister, who is a recreation supervisor for us, she works closely with North Carroll Rec Council and some other councils, and is also very involved with our EPIC programs. Uh, the reason they're both here this morning is they recently received certification from the National Recreation and Parks Association. They have become certified recreation and parks professionals. In order to get that certification, you need to take a, an exam. It's about 150 questions, a couple hours long, uh, talking about general administration, programming, and operations management. Uh, it is not an easy test, and it's quite an accomplishment to have passed that. And uh, we are certainly very proud of them, uh, not only for the job they do for us all year long, but for taking the initiative to take this test and to pass it. So we've congratulated them and we wanted to highlight that with you. And with that, I'll turn it over to the board if you all have anything you'd like to add. And Jeff, thank you very much. And uh, a very uh, deep and sincere congratulations, Becky and Matt, for the work uh, that you do and uh, the representation you have in Carroll County. Uh, my fellow commissioners, I'd like to share. I just wanna thank you for, for the work you do in Carroll County. And especially going for you know getting the the advanced accreditation, very important. Keep moving forward. I appreciate and, and you know the kids and all in Carroll, they really do appreciate everything that the rec department does. So thank you very much. I just, I just want to say you know you you two represent us on the front lines all the time, and uh, education is valuable. But thank you for what you do. Um, what you know uh, everything you do is. Fantastic out there. I hear about it from the uh, rec councils and the people you deal with. So you're doing great. Keep it up. Okay. I want to add that. Park, thank you. The rec and parks is so vitally important to our children and their development and you know, sports activities. So I appreciate everything you do. I wonder if you guys are kayakers as well, because we're opening up. There you go. I love to see that. I'm also curious, uh, Director Daggett, if we're going to have some form of a uh, opening ceremony for the Double Pipe Creek kayak ramp, and if these two would want to be out there and launch with us, that'd be a wonderful thing. A little bit of a spree decor for us, and, <laughs> and encourage people to get out there and enjoy the outdoors, especially after this long pandemic. It's been a bit depressing. So what you guys do in your department is extremely critical to our community, and I appreciate the effort you put into advancing yourself and becoming more of an asset to the county. So thank you very much, and hopefully I'll see you in kayaks this spring. Commissioner Wentz. Uh, so I, I echo all the positive comments from my colleagues. Matt, I, I hear about you a lot up in my area. Uh, the Charles Carroll Rec Council <laughs> and the North and the and the. Um, and the sports complex, you do a, you do an amazing job up, up here in this in the northern part of the county, and we we truly appreciate that. And uh, Becky, as as uh, Commissioner Weaver says, uh, your your efforts have also not uh, fallen on uh, have, have not been silent. We we hear uh, all the time uh, the amount of uh, things and positive things that you bring uh, to a rec council. So uh, thank you very much for all the work that you do. We certainly do appreciate it. Matt, I'm a little set back because you don't have anything in your background. It's just you today. There's no trees <laughs> or anything back there, but whatever. But it's fine. Uh, you could have put up like the sports complex, you know, with the with the anyway. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you all very much for all that you that, that you that you do. And I know, listen, taking those tests are not easy. So I applaud you uh, 
for, for getting through them. Uh, job well done and uh, continue the, the good work for, for us here in the county. Yep, Kudos to both of you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff, any final words on it? I, I do think we need to give Matt a different background. It looks a little bit like a mug shot right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have to work on that. <laughs> the commissioner is taking his time this morning to, uh, to recognize these staff. As I said, they've done a great job, and we're, we're very fortunate to have them in our department. So Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Congratulations again. So. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, before we get into... Uh, the next topic, one other priority, Carol, it was discussed about uh, Piney Run uh, the other day uh, in open session and different courses of action. It was more of a discussion on where we are today and potential where we want to be tomorrow and in the future. On March 11th, there will be two town hall meetings. They'll be virtual, um, two being one in the uh, early afternoon and one in the evening to cover as many folks in the community as we can. Uh, there'll be expertise from AECOM, who uh, we have contracted to do the uh, study, along with our subject matter experts within uh, within the county that will be on the uh, virtual meetings. Um, and I'm trying to think of the times. Is it 11 to 1, 5 to 7? Or? 1, 1 o'clock, and I believe 6 o'clock for the evening. Okay, thanks. It, uh, the first will be starting at 1 p.m., and then the second will be starting at 6 p.m. The details, again, are in uh, the Carroll County uh, web page, on social media. We'll, it, I know it was in the paper, and we'll continue to push it because there's a lot of interest on moving forward uh, here in Carroll County and the Piney Run Reservoir. Okay, let's get into the meat of this. Has there been any additional state directives or updates more than what we've already talked about? No, I don't the think highlight so. for me is the vaccines. So yeah, I don't think so. Everything's been about vaccines yeah. lately, and I think yep. that's again that's what the, this afternoon's going to yeah. be. So okay, um, okay. Do we have Mr. Singer on? Yep. As soon as I can find my uh, unmute button and my camera button. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. May, uh, get the uh, ability to to share. Thank you. Just. Uh, <laughs> Get this up here and um, all right. So uh, good morning, commissioners. I actually, you know, the, the last few weeks have been very stressful as uh, we as we've been trying to reach that, uh, that that very difficult to reach population and our most vulnerable citizens and not having enough vaccine. I actually feel like. Um, it, it, while we would have liked to have gotten this done faster and it's been a relatively slow progress process we're starting to see a little bit more light at the end of the tunnel and i'm going to talk about some of this as we uh progress through the slides this morning um i do appreciate the continued emphasis of the commissioners to uh talk about uh wearing our masks and keeping our distance um we're, we're going to get to the point where some of these uh restrictions at some point in time may be scaled back but now is not the right time we need to uh stay vigilant about this as we continue to get people vaccinated and get the spread down in the community. Um, first thing I just want to, uh, again, is I saw Jeff on here this morning, Jeff Daggett's, your, your, uh, your senior staff at the county have been wonderful, uh, essentially lending us uh, staff from citizen services, uh, emergency management, recreation and parks, and, and public works staff, and, and many others. Uh, they're, they're awesome at what they do. Um, they, they've been assigned all kinds of duties working in our vaccination clinics and our testing sites. And, and they're really just a great bunch of people. And, and uh, you know, I always try to emphasize with our staff that we want to be, be treating the public as, as, as our customers and that we want to provide great, outstanding customer service. And your staff are, are just doing a wonderful job supporting us in all these efforts. And, and uh, you know, their interactions with the public are just, just great. So it's, uh, I, I can't say enough about uh, the support everybody's provided as we've gotten through, as we're, as we're getting through this pandemic. So, uh, oops. Um, the numbers uh, this week are relatively flat compared to last week. Uh, again, as I pointed out last week, a lot of people aren't getting confirmatory PCR tests. We're, we're seeing uh, close to 200 cases per week right now in, in Carroll County. 
um, our, our number of uh, of um, the antigen tests that, that we're, we've seen this week are actually outpacing our number of confirmatory PCR tests. I think people are just uh, that, that now if, if they if they have symptoms and they go get tested with a uh, with a rapid test, uh, a lot of folks are not following up with a PCR test that's confirmatory. But kind of kind of th this this graph here, I think, really helps us understand where the spread is in our community. And, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing still relatively high number of cases, uh, close to 200 uh, a week in, in Carroll County as, as we, uh, you know, thing, things are better, but they're, they're certainly not in, in, a, in a great spot at this point. We still have a substantial spread of this disease in our community. And uh, here's the 14 day rolling average. And this is the, just the confirmed cases. And I would note on this chart here where we talk about the uh, the COVID cases by age group, the rates amongst the 18 to 29-year-old age range seem to be uh, pretty high uh, in comparison. They, there, there are a lot fewer people in this 18 to 29-year-old age group, but uh, but the uh, they, they almost uh, are as high as the uh, 45 to 64-year-old age group, which is a much larger demographic here in Carroll County. So. We're seeing a lot of a lot of transmission and spread amongst that uh, that younger population. Uh, good news on the hospital front. Um, this is our hospitalizations graph that we normally share. I, I think uh, the hospital's feeling much better. Generally, we've been seeing a uh, number of cases that the hospital's treating somewhere in the neighborhood of about about ten total. You know, we were really uh, struggling uh, just a couple of months ago where the uh, number of people in the ICU were, were over 10 on a, on a regular basis. And, uh, and today we're looking at uh, just the number of cases that they're treating in the hospital are, are around that 10 mark. Uh, they have had a few more PUIs today, uh, people under investigation than they've had over um, recent weeks. But, uh, you know, the hospital numbers are, are trending in a very good direction. And here's our hospital hospitalizations and deaths by age group, and our um, our confirmed deaths. We we had another three deaths last week. As far as I know, this week, uh, you, you know, I always talk about how the deaths lag the case numbers, and the case numbers have finally started to come down. Our hospitalizations have started to come down, and I think we're getting to a point where we may see this death number start to trail off uh, next week as well. Um, I don't think that I've seen any confirmed deaths this week uh, in the data that's been out there. So let's hope that we get back down to what we were seeing in the uh, over the summertime, where we were, were where we weren't having this number of deaths that we've been seeing over the the past several months in in our community. Hmm. Our ag center testing. Um, we talked briefly about this. Well, we talked about this uh, extensively last week, and and where we are with things. And uh, our, our testing demand still down. Uh, we, we did make a, a little bit different adjustment than what I what I had told you that we were thinking about doing last week. I was telling you that we were thinking about going to two days a week, but we want to make sure that uh, we're able to provide timely testing to people. So my staff came back to me and they said, "Well, why don't we just reduce the number of hours that we're testing and keep the three days a week on uh, Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday?" So we've cut the hours back at the testing site. Uh, that we, we could keep up with the demand and we could certainly ramp back up again if we had uh, had a higher demand for testing. But the uh, right now we're going to maintain uh, three days of testing on Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and we're going to run the testing site from 10 to 12. Uh, that, that's cutting it back by essentially two hours from what we were doing before. Okay, now the thing that everybody wants to talk about is vaccinations. And you know, today, today and yesterday were, were the first days that I, I felt like we're starting to see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel with what we're doing with our vaccination efforts. And I mean, we've got a long way to go to get uh, the percentage of the population vaccinated that we want, so that we can uh, we can really cut down on the community spread. But uh, the, the I, I do want to just mention this: the state's uh, mass vaccination sites. The one thing that concerns me the most, and they've talked about tightening up on this, is is we've been focusing so much on trying to reach our most vulnerable individuals and and certain priority groups that are in high risk professions and things like that, but the state has told us that essentially at their at their mass vaccination sites that they're doing an honor system and, and it concerns me that 
you know, we've got people who aren't even in these priority groups that are, that are claiming that they're in one C or, or one B and, and uh, essentially they're taking their word for it. Now they have said that they're going to try to, to find a way that they can start requiring some documentation, but uh, it, it's, it's just concerning when we we've had such a difficult time reaching our 75 plus population and really even trying to get out of one B that, uh, yeah, that, that we're not, we don't have a little bit more tighter controls on that. Um, Commissioner um, Rothstein had mentioned that we've been in 1B, um, but I, I actually wanted to tell you today that we're getting ready to gradually progress somewhat into 1C. It's not going to be a, everybody in 1C can get vaccinated today type of thing, but we are gradually opening things up to the people who are over 65, and, and some we're going to start looking at some other uh, categories that are in 1C, and we're going to start opening it up to those people, and we're going to work through that just like we did in 1B. So, um, as we get into 1C, you know, it, it, when, when it's your turn to get vaccinated and you're ready, we, we want to get you we want to get you vaccinated. Um, one of the things we're going to be doing with 1C is uh, it gets into manufacturing and, and um, lab services and agricultural uh, production and things of that nature. We want to be working with our economic development uh, department and potentially, well, specifically reaching out to some of our manufacturers in, in the county and looking to potentially even take uh, clinics to their facilities. There, there are a couple that I specifically have in mind right now, but I want to talk to the folks over in economic development and, and develop a plan so that as we get into that part of 1C, uh, we, we could potentially make it easy for, for people to get vaccinated, maybe even on site where they work if we have a large enough population to vaccinate there. Um, wanted to mention that the... Uh, the, the, the uh, National Guard's doing some uh, restructuring of their support, and, and I, I have to give the Air Force a hard time because they're bailing out and going to Timonium, but we're being upgraded and getting Army soldiers. So, you know, <laughs> the Air Force can only stay in one place for a month or two at a time. The Army goes in and occupies and, and sticks around. So I, I look at it as we're getting upgraded, and we'll, we'll be getting Army soldiers to support our vaccination efforts. Okay, so where are we in the week of February uh, 28th? We're, we're continuing 1B, but I, as I mentioned, we're, we're gradually getting into uh, some of the 1C. Uh, there's new enhancements in the registration system. Did an experiment this week with uh, the higher education and the continuity of government folks by sending out single links, and that seems to be working uh, fairly well. There were some glitches in the system, but we identified them and got the state to help fix some of those. Um, we're reaching out to our senior housing and homebound patients, and I'll talk about that on one of, well, I might as well talk about that here. We're partnering with LifeBridge. Um, you know, we're, we're focusing very much on wanting to try to get as much of the population vaccinated that are most vulnerable as quickly as possible. Um, so we're trying to put hundreds of people through mass vaccination sites. But there are homebound patients who are very vulnerable, can't get out to, uh, uh, to a mass vaccination site and that type of thing. So we've... Uh, partnered with LifeBridge, and, and we've got a team of nurses from LifeBridge that are working with us, essentially pick up some vaccine from us. Uh, we've identified people through citizen services, social services, and the health department's uh, adult evaluation uh, program here, here to uh, find people who are truly homebound and send this team of nurses out. They pick up vaccine from us at the health department, go out and vaccinate some people, stop by one of our clinics, pick up some more vaccine, and and go vaccinate some more homebound. We just started doing this yesterday. Uh, there, there are about 40 or 50 people that have been identified so far that, that we're reaching out to. Um, we're, we're prioritizing those people that have come through either social services, citizen services, or through the health department's uh, evaluation program for, for being truly homebound. So if somebody feels that they know somebody who's homebound, they should have somebody reach out to that, those agencies and those agencies can send those names forward to the health department to try to get those people prioritized. Um, next week, we're reaching out to, uh, we're going to be doing a, um, a low-income senior housing um, vaccination clinic that we're doing in conjunction with, uh, with LifeBridge on site. And we're also looking at coordinating um, some transportation and registration of people who are living in, in the uh, low-income housing for, for seniors that uh, don't have the technology and don't have transportation to get them to some of our, our, our uh, mass vaccination clinics. 
Next week, we're also doing a higher education and continuity of government uh, clinic that uh, will reach most of the Carroll Community College, McDaniel College, and, and some of the uh, critical government infrastructure. Oops. Make sure I don't go too many slides forward. This is our uh, vaccine distribution uh, chart that talks about how many doses we've been allocated each week. And uh, the commissioner referred to us getting a, a few extra doses this week. We got an extra 500 doses. And, you know, the governor's really been pushing us to get things out as quickly as possible. So in, in some cases, you'll see where the blue line's a little higher than the green line. And that's because we've, we've essentially, um, this week, I, I got the extra 500 doses that we were um, allocated. We got those on Tuesday. I uh, actually put, opened up an extra 200 slots in a clinic on Tuesday, and, and we, we, we put those out the same day we essentially got them, and we opened up a clinic for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine where um, we, we opened this to everybody 65 and, and above, which will be held on, on, on Friday. So we're starting to get into that 1C somewhat. Our, um, as, as we get into the next slide, we'll talk about some of these numbers and where we see things going. So... This week we had, uh, I think, essentially 900 people that we vaccinated on Monday and Tuesday who were over 75. And uh, we're, we're still reaching out to people by phone and those that are, that are hard to get in touch with to, to make sure that we can get them registered using our staff, uh, staff from Citizen Services, a lot of people making phone calls and getting people signed up. As I mentioned, the Friday clinic will be open to 65 plus. And as we start having fewer people who are over 75, um, who need to be reached, we're going to start opening up those clinics to people who are over 65, at least portions of those clinics. We actually have a, a clinic in Eldersburg today to give second shots to the folks that got them the first time that are over 75. And um, we're going back to Eldersburg next week to give first doses again. And, and we're, we're filling that clinic right now with people who are over 75. But if we uh, if we start finding it difficult to fill, we'll start opening it up to people who are over 65. And the week of uh, March the 21st, we're going to uh, we're going back out and do first doses again in uh, in Mount Airy in North Carroll. So we're, we're we're progressing along. And if you look at this chart over here, where we talk about the the number of estimated people vaccinated in, in the 75 plus age group, we've got about 4,000 people left. We've 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 had 7,300 that are vaccinated in in Carroll County and. Uh, roughly 4,400 of those have been done by the health department's clinics, and the other 3,000 could be uh, folks who are living in assisted livings or, or nursing home or have gotten their shots elsewhere. <laughs> so not everybody's going to want to get vaccinated, and, and I see that we're, I, I think we're, within the next week or two, we're going to have most of the people who are over 75 that wanted, wanted a vaccine, haven't been offered an opportunity to get vaccinated, and, and we want to continue to encourage people who are over 75 that if they've if they've thought about it, changed their mind, whatever, to please sign up with us and 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 get vaccinated. And if people know somebody who's over 75 that's they're having difficulty uh, getting an appointment, have them call us because right now they're our highest priority and they're the people that we need to get into our clinics and get them vaccinated. Um, our school system. I talked to the superintendent this morning. Uh, he said that we opened up. Uh, a clinic. We've got a clinic coming up uh, in the next week or two that's that's going to vaccinate another 450 teachers. And he said uh, this is the first time they didn't have the clinic fill up within minutes. So they're going to uh, do a survey for me and kind of figure out how many people we have that still need to be vaccinated. We uh, we don't have a good way of tracking people that have gotten vaccinated at the mass vaccination sites or, or through a pharmacy or something else. So we just kind of I need him to figure out for me how many people we think we have left that are in that group, and and we're gonna we're gonna get them uh, try try to get them vaccinated and and essentially hopefully be done with that part soon. Um, continuity of government and the higher education. We've got a clinic for that coming up next Friday. I think we'll be able to meet, reach most of that group in the one clinic. We've got 550 slots scheduled there for people to be vaccinated. And, and then we can start moving more seriously into phase 1C as we get these groups done. <laughs> the, um, I, I will say when, when I reached out to higher ed and, and whatnot, I found that uh, about 20 to 25% of the people had already been vaccinated, uh, whether they went to mass clinics or, or they went somewhere else. So 
Um, while, while we had certain numbers that we were th expecting to have to reach, um, not, not all of them are needing to be vaccinated through our clinics. And, and I'm glad, you know, it's good to uh, have less people to vaccinate than what we anticipated. It'll help us get into those other phases more quickly. Um, do want to talk about something that's very important that's just starting the day. We had some discussion about this, but the quarantine requirements for people who have been fully vaccinated. Um, and, and this all may change at some point in time, but as of today, the new requirement is, is that if somebody's been exposed to uh, somebody with COVID, normally we're requiring the people to quarantine for, for a minimum of 10 days. If the person's been fully vaccinated now, which, and uh, it's, it's got to be at least two weeks after they received their, their final dose, so with the Pfizer or Moderna, it would be after their, two weeks after their second dose. Or with the J&J &J vaccine, it would be two days after, I mean, two weeks after their uh, initial dose. Those people would not be required to quarantine. Now, it, it's, it's from uh, two weeks after their, their, their final dose up until three months after that final dose. So it gives you about a, a really a two and a half month window. And I, I see this as being really most helpful to us in our schools, as, as many of the school staff have recently been vaccinated and, and um, you know, it may help the, the superintendent with staffing there because uh, th those people that have been va recently vaccinated, they've got that essentially three month grace period, just like people who have uh, actually had COVID. It's essentially the same type of thing where, where they won't have to be quarantined if they've been exposed. Now they do have to monitor themselves for symptoms if they were to become sick, they would have to, to stay isolated from people until they, they could have COVID ruled out. But it, it does help with uh, not having to quarantine people who have, who have been vaccinated for that period of time. I don't know what they're going to do in the future. I don't know whether there's going to be a booster shot. There's, there's a lot being done to study uh, the, the long-term effectiveness of the vaccine, whether or not we, we, we change how long uh, people could be exempt from quarantine. Or, or whether or not boosters are eventually going to be required. We're going to have to see where all of that goes. But right now, as of today, if, if I got my, my second shot two weeks ago, uh, I'm good not to have to be quarantined if I'm exposed for, from, that, from, from the date of that shot until three months out. So it's all, in our, um, it's all in our contact tracing system. That system's actually going to interface with something called Immunet, which has the records of all these immunizations in there. And it's one thing that, you know, a lot of these data systems haven't done what we wanted them to do, but this is a great opportunity because uh, the, the actual vaccination database system, when we do contact tracing, we talk to somebody, we can know whether they, they've been vaccinated or not, and whether they can be exempt from quarantine. So all that documentation's all together in one place so that it makes it easy for our contact tracers and the people in the public who have been vaccinated to know whether they need to be quarantined or not. Um, talked about the homebound with the LifeBridge team. I, I really love the fact that we're working with LifeBridge because that lets us focus on our mass vaccination clinics. And uh, the, the one thing I want to ma mention about our, our, our mass clinics is we've got the capacity to do more for sure. Um, I'm looking forward to next Friday with the higher ed and the continuity of government. We're, uh, we're going to try to put 550 people through in a two and a half hour period, which I think we can easily do that. But uh, that's, that's a fairly high capacity. And, you know, at that rate, you, you could be looking at easily doing uh, over a thousand doses at any of our clinics on a, on a given day. Um, the, the last piece that I want to talk about is the travel order is still in effect and, and that is a legal order. And it doesn't have the, the, your vaccination status doesn't have any bearing on this. And so until the state changes the, uh, the travel order, uh, people who, even if you've been vaccinated, still have to follow the, the quarantine or testing requirements that are in the, uh, in the state order regarding travel. So that, that doesn't get impacted like the quarantine does. I think the, the kind of important things for people to know as we're progressing through some of this stuff. <laughs> so you all mentioned equity this morning and the fact that the governor is having a, a press conference on equity. And this is something we've, uh, Sue Doyle, who's my behavioral health person has been assigned as our equity officer. And we've been, uh, we've been trying to figure out how we make sure that we're not leaving anybody behind in Carroll County. 
Obviously, we don't have a very large minority population here, but this uh, this graph uh, the, depicts this this chart depicts uh, how we're doing percentage wise with the people who are over 75 that are in specific populations. So, as you can see, our our um, non-Hispanic white population we've reached 54.4 percent of those those people with our vaccinations as of the date that this report was run. Uh, we're doing pretty good with our African-American population. Uh, we've reached 50.9%. The, uh, the Hispanic uh, and the Asian population are lagging, and we're trying to figure out how we reach them. Uh, we, we've, I think the reason that we've been successful is we, uh, we ran a clinic over at Access Carroll last, last week to help uh, reach some of, the, uh, some of the underserved population that they serve, and, and that was, was really good at reaching some of the uh, – targeted minority populations that were that are harder to reach. Um, continuing to work on these low-income housing um, facilities that we have and partnering with your um, with your folks at, at Citizen Services to, uh, to figure out how we uh, reach the people in this, these uh, low-income housing communities for seniors. Um, we have a clinic scheduled next week with LifeBridge that we're going to go out to uh, one of these facilities and vaccinate people on site. We're assisting people with registering that don't have access to uh, the internet, and you all are offering transportation assistance to people that can't get out and get to the uh, mass vaccination clinics is, is very helpful. So we're going to keep this in the uh, report for the next, uh, well, as we continue to provide these updates on a regular basis and just kind of keep an eye on where we're going. I actually think we're, uh, we're being probably more successful than most other places in the state. In, in reaching some of our minority populations. Uh, I'd be, you know, if anybody has ideas, I'm certainly willing to listen, but we've been talking to all of our community partners about how to best uh, make sure that we can reach uh, populations as we, even as we move through the phases, we wanna continue to make sure that we're reaching out to our uh, minority populations and they're keeping up with everybody else. So I think I've covered everything that I intended to cover today. There was a lot of information and I did a lot of talking, but uh, as always, visit our website. Uh, give us a call if, uh, if you've got questions at our call center, and we'll continue to get through this. Uh, I'm, I'm actually very encouraged this week about where we are with the whole vaccination process, and finally starting to get into 1C is very important. Uh, Maggie Coons always puts it to me, it was a really bad year to be 74 years old because the people who are in that 65 to 74-year-old age group are have been very upset that we haven't been able to reach them because of uh, our focus on the uh, most vulnerable people who are over 75. And, and uh, you know, as we're starting to progress, it's going to take us a lot of time because there are a huge number of people in, in 1C, even more than we're in 1B. So we need some patience, but we're starting to progress into uh, 1C and, and be able to reach additional people who were not uh, eligible to be vaccinated by us before. So that's all I have, commissioners. If you've got any questions, I'll be glad to try to address them. Ed, um, thank you, as always, to you and your team for the incredible selfless work that you're doing and uh, continuing due diligence taking care of our community. Uh, just the only comment I have is when you talk about equity, it's also equity on locations. It's equity in demographics, but it's also equity in locations of Carroll County and ensuring that Carroll County is covered the best we can as a blanket, not one district over another, one community over another. Helping to do that is also communicating to us uh, where you're gonna be um, so we can continue to share that with the community. Even, uh, even if they're already filled, this way we know this is where uh, you're distributing doses and vaccinating folks. So uh, again, I applaud everything you're doing. Um, LifeBridge is uh, having their vaccination clinic on um, 26 Liberty Road in Old Court uh, in Baltimore County. Um, and that's also close to Eldersburg, just down Liberty Road. So there's folks that can go from, you know, closer Eldersburg right down there. And I think they're already in 1C. So that's another avenue for them to, uh, to go after uh, getting vaccinated. So um, anything for the, the group? 
Mr. Singer, I'll tell you what, you do an excellent job presenting information and talking. You ought to run for county commissioner one day. We, we'd love to have you on the board as a replacement. <laughs> I really like the, the I really like the numbers being around 65% now with the 75 plus. That is very encouraging. I think that's where our focus had been that they were the most vulnerable. So I applaud you all. And I really appreciate the update of the mobile vaccination because I just received a phone call yesterday from a constituent who has a 90 plus parent living with them and they were concerned they didn't want to get their parent out of house. So this, this is really good for all those people out there faced with the same situation. So I applaud you and your staff. I also want to mention, hopefully we can get you and your staff out kayaking at Double Pipe Creek Park when we do the ceremony. I think that'd be a wonderful thing. And, and, and we can celebrate getting out of wood, so to speak, and have a little bit of fun and uh, not have mass while we're out there on the water kayaking and yell at one another and play around. So I applaud you and your staff for everything you've done. Thank you very much. Anything else? Yeah, I'm I'm good. I, I just I'm sorry. I, I just real quick, yeah. Ed, I want to thank you for for uh, the assistance that you're providing for those in that age group of 75 mm -hmm. and over, because a lot of the folks are having trouble uh, navigating through you know the computers and and what have you. So uh, I've gotten a lot of calls on that, and you guys have been right there to assist with those folks. That's very important too, because not only are folks frustrated about it's taken a while to get the vaccine, yeah. but they're frustrated in trying to sign up because, you know, am I supposed to do this? Do I have, you know, I had a couple people say, well, do I have to take a photo of my insurance card? I mean, there's a lot of stuff on there. And, you know, seven, we got a lot of really bright, smart, sharp, over 75, and they still have trouble navigating the system. So you guys have been right there. That's an important aspect, too. We can talk about all the rest of the stuff all day long but your personal connection that you're making you and your staff to help those folks is also very important. So another great thing about what happens here in the County. I don't know that that kind of service is happening in other jurisdictions. I kind of hard to tell that, but appreciate that too. So thank you. Yep. Absolutely. Um, Commissioner Frazier. Thanks Commissioner. I will say that I, I've taken the opportunity. I, I've got some new, new friends that are in that, uh, in that demographic of 75 <laughs> plus the, the a couple of them that, they just happened to get a hold of me, and, and, and uh, it, it takes about two minutes for, for me to sign somebody up. I've been through the system so many times now. Sometimes if they're on the list and it's their turn, I just go ahead and sign them up. And, and uh, so I've made some new friends that way. So it's been kind of uh, <laughs> kind of a neat experience. And uh, anyway, so so uh, it's I'm glad that we're we're able to help people get get through this process. Yes, the the system's not not perfect by any means They're, they are making uh, improvements and uh, we, we just want to make sure that we uh, I, I guess my, my thought is and the, the message to the community is is that we want to make sure that everybody you talk about equity commissioner uh, Rossi and I think you're right in trying to reach the different corners of the county and, and is is to make sure that everybody who wants to be able to be vaccinated when it's their turn has an opportunity and that's what that's what it's all about to me is is to make sure that we don't we don't leave anybody behind, whether they got challenges with technology or they, they've got challenges with transportation. And we've we've tried to address all those kind of things or if they if they can't get out. And it's taken us a while to get around to the homebound, but you know, we really needed to try to reach uh, as many people as we could early on as quickly as possible. And now we're we're able to go back and try to pick up some of these pieces where we want to make sure that nobody falls through the cracks. So certainly have them reach out to us here at the health department if uh, if they need assistance. And and we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to, to get vaccinated so we can get through this and, and move on. Yep. Okay. And uh, speaking of moving on, we are going to move on now um, to fire and EMS. Ed, I will see you on the 9th. Um, I think at 5 p.m. Uh, for our virtual town hall and web uh, webinar, whatever we call it. So uh, thank you again, and thank you to your team. Thank you. See you later. Yes, sir. Okay, Mr. McCoy, let's talk about where we're at with fire and EMS. Okay, good morning, commissioners. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to join you again today. Uh, we're going to start back up with our presentation as we've been doing. Um, I'm going to also have Taylor and Ted Zaleski with me um, to assist. 
All right, so as we started, I'm, I'm gonna breeze through the three primary questions of why we're doing this and uh, the actions that we're taking. The ultimate goal is to transfer the burden of employment from the volunteers to the county. And our other goal is to transition current station positions to career positions uh, based on uh, your approved hiring schedule. So as a reminder, November 12th uh, of last year, we met uh, the four milestones were MOU budget, hiring in the Public Safety Training Center. Uh, last week we uh, discussed hiring. We're still on that hiring option as of today. So today we wanted to present some hiring scenarios uh, of looking at two, three, or four stations uh, per year. Um, all the models we're gonna be presenting for you are based on the same number of stations per year uh, over the next five to seven fiscal years for planning purposes. Um, no final actions required today. Um, information is presented just uh, for your direction uh, regarding the recommended budget. Uh, just a reminder, Carroll County is comprised of 14 stations with 13 uh, stations having employees and EMS units. Our recommendation has always been to transition those uh, employment responsibilities to mirror, to mirror the existing complement meaning that if a station is trying to employ a minimum of one EMS unit and a fire apparatus driver, that we try to offer the same as we go through this transition. So the assignment goals, uh, when you look at the breakdown uh, of our schedule, we have one station with 24 personnel, three stations that would require 20 personnel, nine stations that would require 12 personnel. And we'll talk a little bit more about those three uh, groups as we go through our hiring. The original departmental uh, goal uh, was to start July, 2021. We continue to work towards that when, in our work steps, uh, staffing the busy stations first, which provided coverage to the highest populated areas, highest call volumes. It would give us the ability to evaluate and test our employment processes and the needs of the different offices within the county government to support the fire EMS department. And it would pro provide the optimal coverage. So we, as we discussed last week, we understand we have a difficult budget process with a lot of legislation, uh, needs of multiple uh, departments within the county. Um, as we continue to move towards our goal of possibly six stations in FY22, we understand that the goal may need to be adjusted based on budgetary requirements. So today, what we want to focus on is how many stations uh, do you want to hire? Um, we're focusing basically on our cost of clear, providing a clear picture of the funding that's needed without any complication of any grant money, anything else, but basically what we need to budget um, to show you the, those scenarios. So scenario one, it would be two stations uh, per year. And I apologize, my it's in the way of my uh, slide. Uh, up in the corner, it tells you how many fiscal years it would take to complete the hiring. But with two stations per year, uh, it would be staffing of 24 personnel for FY22 would be assigned to station three in Westminster. That would be two EMS units, uh, one being an EMS supervisor, one EVOD, emergency vehicle operator driver, and one supervisor per shift. Then staffing of 20 personnel would be assigned to Sykesville, station 12. That would be two EMS units and one emergency vehicle operator driver per shift. Hey, Bob, just um, clarification. Yes, sir. How long is a shift? Shift is 24 hour shift and it's the 24 on 72 off. 24 on 72 off. So this would so, be a 40, 42 hour work week. Okay, because I'm just looking at the one one understanding what shifts are and the numbers um because I, right. I just don't know so i appreciate that um some of the basics does 24 are we talking about 24 people or 24 positions there would be 24, so, 24 assigned to westminster station uh with six personnel assigned to work per shift 
does that give flexibility um, for the shifts if uh, there's folks that are either sick or, you know, long-term leave or, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, is it, is it, and this is all full-time, correct? This is all full-time personnel, not full-time, part-time. That is correct. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I, okay. And, and I do have Taylor. We're going we're to kind of go back and forth with these scenarios because I want to, um, I want to be able to discuss the financial aspect of what the new dollar costs are going to be. So Taylor and Ted are going to be on with me. So Taylor, if you want to go over this slide. Hey, hey Bob, could you go back to uh, Commissioner Rothstein's uh, other question about the flexibility? What, what, what happens if someone calls out sick or, or what, what, you know, what are we doing about that? What we can do is um, we can look at uh, establishing uh, the daily shift staffing, but also have a minimum number to deal with leave abatement. Uh, but there are going to be times where until we get more personnel in the field uh, that there may be over time. Okay. Well, so, so that is actually, that, that is part of my concern and you're hitting it the overtime. Um, right. Is there, is there a course of action or a, you know, a model that can have a hybrid of full-time and part-time um, positions where part-time positions can fill in gaps where we're uh, not, you know, using overtime and also, um, I don't know, maybe less expensive because we're not also providing benefits to part-time. I don't know if there's a, a hybrid effort or, is that something that should not be looked at? No, absolutely. I, I've uh, discussed that since last year that I would like to continue part-time employment uh, just for that reason to, um, to assist with leave abatement because what I'm providing you is pretty much minimum numbers to mirror the complement of the stations now. So if we could employ part-time as well for leave abatement and vacancies, that would be perfect. Uh, and that is definitely my recommendation that I will be working with HR on. Yeah, so I think that needs to be part of this model. If you're talking personnel, 24 personnel, and that's full-time, what would be the supplemental part-time, you know, uh, personnel, for that matter? Um, Correct. To be, able, to be able to, you know, look at this whole thing, or to, to look at this holistically. Um, I don't know if I'm using okay. the right words or not, but you're um, close. That's close. close. I, I yeah, don't that's know. close. I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm looking over it, Commissioner Wands because I mean, he, he, well, he lives the, and walks it. So the, the the you know the thing that I and you're you're hitting on it a little bit, uh, Ed, is when we begin to do this, we're going to have uh, mm -hmm. an obvious uh, the obvious issue of those that have been loyal and dedicated right. as part time employees. We're going to almost say, hey thanks for what you've done and there's the door. Uh, so I, I want to make sure that, that those that are currently uh, employed as part-time personnel, keeping in mind also that a lot of these folks may be employed elsewhere that are supplementing their income uh, as a result of being able to get extra dollars here in, in the County have the ability to, to not just be, uh, exited out the door there you know some right. sort of a phased in approach if you will and i think that's where you were going ed I, right i i am and, and keeping them engaged because if we minimize them they will walk out the door um i i would think i mean that that's what i would do i'd be looking for other employment so um i don't know if it's a phased in approach or if it's a model that is a hybrid where you have full-time and part-time together um mm -hmm. And I think I think the latter is a better solution, but again, I I don't know. Maybe uh, budgeting can uh, talk about the the cost associated with this, or are we just not there yet, uh, Taylor? So the cost that Bob has on the next slide, they represent um, this model that he has in front of you. Um, so the if 
yeah, so if you'll see on the bottom line there where it says general, total general fund needed um, year over year, that money would increase. If we were going to do a part-time, if we assume that we're going to keep the model that he's already talking about, if it's in addition to what we've already had. So these numbers could change. Um, but what you see in front of you, commissioners, is a breakdown <clears throat> according to a hiring schedule of two stations per year. Um, so in the first year, it's Westminster Sykesville, and there's a salary and benefits line, ongoing operating costs, additional county employees, and that includes three employees for HR, two for management and budget, and one for accounting. Then there's one-time costs, and those include um, ambulance purchases, as well as outfitting of our new employees, uh, SCBA masks and fire suppression gear, and then the revenues that would be offset, which includes the EMS billing revenue that we would receive, um, and then pulling back on some of the money that we currently give Visa um, through EMS 24-7 and through uh, our payment of their EBOD people. So, okay. Hey, Bob, I have a question for you. We're starting off, if you're doing a scenario, with 44 personnel uh, for, between Westminster and Sykesville. Instead of doing two stations for this scenario a year, why don't we do 44 personnel a year? And that way it wouldn't take seven years to fill out the entire county. Have you looked at that? And spread the 44 across. Yeah, like the, the other stations require less personnel. So in year two, instead of two stations, you might get three stations done. In year three, you might get four or five stations done with those 44 people. Where, where are the most needs? And, and I apologize because Commissioner Wendt, you, you were no, about no, to I say think, something. Yeah. I, I guess I'm just saying, where is the most needs within the county to make this model work? I mean, is it where the highest capacity is, which is Westminster Sykesville, or is it the smaller stations um, that are in a challenging situation? I mean, that's what this is all about, is to keep the doors open and keep the equipment and, you know, taking care of the community uh, reliable. Um, and I don't know if that is... Westminster Sykesville uh, or if it's one of those plus others I I don't know um, so well to, to an, go ahead. yeah to, an, to answer several of your questions let me go back to <laughs> let me go back to the part-time um, and all the discussions that I've had uh, with the volunteers yeah. a lot of the existing employees we're looking at the avenues to ensure that we don't have a mass exodus of service providers so what we've what we've looked at is one as career personnel are assigned to stations any part-time employees that are not in a position to apply with us will have other stations further down a list to be able to offer their services so we're hoping that will assist those other stations as they move we're mm -hmm. also looking at volunteers in the county if they take a position with us can they also volunteer? And I believe we've resolved that issue that they will also be able to do that. Um, we will also have the possibility in the beginning phases of the department that uh, employees will also be able to work part-time for the individual corporations um, on their days off. So we're trying to make sure that there's plenty of opportunity that we don't lose the personnel by addressing all those issues. When you look at the placement of personnel, there are stations that probably are in more need than others. Um, but as we look at this as building a system, uh, instead of patching holes, uh, we're looking at the cost that's going to be associated with the county having to establish this system. Um, so what we're doing is we're looking at Sykesville and Westminster providing 50% out of call volume out of two stations out of 14. Um, some of the largest population, the most opportunity for calls. Uh, and then we continue to utilize station employees that we will continue to fund and available part-timers to continue to support the smaller stations as we continue to grow the system. But also too, to keep the gap between what the volunteers pay and what the counties pay, it's also very strategic that we start with the highest uh, response stations uh, to also generate the most EMS revenue to keep that gap minimal. So those are that's the approach that we're taking and why we started uh, with the busiest stations and working our way backwards. 
are uh, are part timers, and this is a Carroll County Fire Department culture question. Are part timers in the stations more loyal to their stations, or to the role as being a part timer, willing to shift from one station to another? Because and and the reason I'm bringing this up is kind of where Commissioner Wance you know, said, which is extremely important to me is, you know, the centerpiece of the community are these fire stations and the, and the, and the firemen and women that are uh, serving in those stations. And I don't want to kick them to the curb, you know, as we're moving towards this, you know, career uh, level approach in that. And again, I'm not saying we shouldn't move forward. I want to move forward. I just want to make sure that, um, you know, it's, we're taking care of people as, as well as we're taking care of the, this effort. I don't, I don't know if I'm making much more sense than that. I think uh, the last thing is, I imagine you're having these conversations with the ESAC and others, and they're engaging in these type of uh, discussions as well. Um, I think that's more rhetorical than anything, because I expect it's a fact, but um that's just a concern of mine is, is people, you know, uh, especially as we're going through this transition. I mean, yeah, it's, um, Oh, I'm sorry. Well, how, how do part-timers work now? Are they, um, is it working very well or is it an issue? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. Is it, it would be easier to fill in full-time, uh, across the board or with the part-timers, uh, working on well commissioner you have to understand part-timers if they're committed to another job they could sign up to fill a shift for us and we believe that we have that vacancy filled and then their job uh, requirement interferes and they have to cancel the shift uh, right now there are op there are a lot of op times in volunteer stations where they have a vacancy at a last minute cancellation from a part-timer i'm not saying that it, the system won't work but as we place personnel in firehouses uh, we have an obligation to keep those positions filled at all times. And us as a county having a pool of volunteers available uh, will definitely assist us in, with the overtime abatement. But also, too, from the, uh, from the thought process of part-timers and their loyalty to a station, um, yes, there might be, uh, you know, there's no perfect scenario where everyone is going to be happy with what we're doing building a system. Uh, but if a uh, part-timer is not going to apply with us, but has to vacate Sykesville, there will be 10 other stations that they will have the opportunity to, to provide their services for. And we were hoping that we can push their efforts to another station that maybe run less calls and will be able to assist us for several more years or possibly become a member of the county pool of part-timers. Yeah, what about looking at 44 people uh, per year instead of two stations per year? I mean, we 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 can do that. I mean, but as far but as that way, it would get done quicker we, that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and you'll see you'll see our option down the road. We're looking at those you're looking at those different models of the 24, the 20, or the 12s, and we're going to discuss that a little bit further um, down the options. Um, but like I said, um, to get the trying to limit that gap, um, even if we want to say 44 people, I would still focus on the two stations in the beginning that deliver 50% of the county service. Right, right. So, I agree with that. Yes. Uh, just one question, uh, Taylor, I guess this goes back to you. Uh, we're looking at the bottom line. This is additional money from the general fund needed every year out to make this happen, correct? Correct, Commissioner. Now, if we were to get safer uh, grants, and that would start in, well, I guess, 25 is where we hit the wall on that, would we put this money in anyway right now so we're prepared for it, or how would that work? Now, let me jump in for a second. Um, we'll have to talk more about what we will go after in safer grants and, and when we would do that. But I think the, the easy answer to your question is 
yes, we have to build a plan for how we're going to pay this until we have some reason to expect that a safer grant is going to be part of the picture. When you look at these bottom lines, going to go back to your earlier questions about part-timers, I just want to make sure it was clear that this does not include funding for that part-time staffing. So if, if we take that route, these numbers get bigger. Correct. Yeah, that's the... No, I, yeah, that, that yeah. that's correct. But yeah, Which, which I'm not correct. sure we can afford for them right. to get a whole lot bigger, right. which is why I think we're getting all these questions because right. are there things that we could or couldn't do right. uh, in order to get to that bottom line that's acceptable to us? Uh, you, you mentioned, Bob, that, or maybe it was you, Taylor, one-time funding that's on this first scenario. What, how many scenarios do you have? Maybe we should get through the scenarios right. first. Before we, we're kind of we're stuck on scenario one. Why don't we get through the – what do you got, three, I think, Bob? Four. Oh, well, then, okay. Why don't we get through the four first, and then, <laughs> then maybe we may, – may, maybe that will give us the options of the questions that are popping in our minds here. Yeah, and, and the scenarios are very similar in the fact that we're looking at a two, two, two stations per year or we can convert it to personnel, three stations per year or four. So basically scenario two, it would be three stations, um, but it would be factored out over how many fiscal years uh, for planning purposes, which means just in FY22, we would secure staffing for Westminster, Sykesville, and Mount Airy. And those numbers that you're seeing underneath each station is based on per shift, so four per shift, um, and, and so on. So what we want to do is give you the numbers of, especially the bottom line, what your true cost, what new dollars you will need on a three-station per year hiring plan. So, Taylor, it, I, if you want to go with this one. Sure. So all the assumptions are the same, just speeding up the schedule. Um, the main changes that you'll see here are um, to speak to Commissioner Ranch's question that the one-time funding. And again, that's based on us purchasing the ambulances, so buying them out of their current assets and then taking ownership ourselves, as well as um, the outfitting of our employees with SCBA and fire gear. And so you'll see um, fiscal the last fiscal year, it does match with all of these. So fiscal year 28, it, you're all around that $11 million in additional general fund needed. Okay, and then if you go to scenario three, four station hiring, um, this is the quickest method to, uh, to get through our initial hiring plan. Uh, first year FY22 would be Westminster, Sykesville, Mount Airy, and Tawnytown. Uh, so then this would be your uh, true dollar cost, uh, new dollars, uh, if we were to hire four stations per year until the initial plan was completed. Okay. I think most of the explanations, Taylor, are the same on this, just the increased amount. Yeah. Why is this cheaper than scenario two or three? Yeah, two. Say that again. Why is this one cheaper than scenario two? Oh, it isn't. No, it no, goes no, from into four three. Right. Yeah, it's not cheaper. All right. And then the last thing that we brought up when we were talking in budget sessions um, is like a, a two two or three model. Um, when you start looking at the three groups I showed you. We have one group of 24 personnel for one station, uh, three to 20, and then it goes down to 12 for the remaining nine. Is that for the first two fiscal years, we could hire two stations per year. Uh, and then the remaining, since the number would drop down to 36, you could hire staffing uh, three stations per year, the third fiscal year out. Uh, so you basically be looking at hiring 44 FY22, 40 and 23, and then 36 personnel, the three remaining. Uh, you would accomplish your goal in five budget years. Uh, and this is what that would look like, uh, total of employees, as you can see with that schedule, what I just said, and basically the stations that would be filled. That's closer to what you were talking about. Yeah, right. that, yes. which is what, you, that's what Dennis, you were, you were trying to hit on. Yeah. More, from a, more from a personnel perspective. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, the, go ahead, Bob. I'm going to let oh, you finish. Go ahead. No, no, not a problem, sir. Um, Taylor, if you want to just discuss this real quickly. Um, yeah, so again, the same approach, and I think this does kind of address more of what Commissioner Frazier had suggested with coming with a more personnel approach. It's um, a little bit more smoothed out, and again, you still get it done within the five fiscal years. And one thing, um, one thing I, I want to remind everyone of is when we look at the, um, in one of the earlier slides, um, you, you saw that uh, our EMS only and our EVOD money, the EMS 24 seven and the EVOD money, we, we provide the volunteers approximately uh, $5 million, I believe per year. You also have to keep in mind that most of the volunteer stations will tell you that they utilize the EMS billing money um, and many are subsidizing their employees now with fundraising activities. So if you look at the 5 million we provide and then I know in 2019, there was $4.3 million of EMS revenue generated. You're looking at almost $10 million of what uh, total cost that we estimate the volunteers are trying to, with the service that the volunteers are trying to provide. Um, so because that EMS revenue stays with the volunteers to help pay for those employees. So they're expending anywhere from 10 over $11 million per year to provide this service. Uh, are these costs also have the projected income from billing into these numbers? Yes, they do, Commissioner. That's in the bottom line, their revenues. And so I think Bob just mentioned um, around a $9 million. If you look under fiscal year 26 in the second to last row, that's that $10 million. So that includes the EVOD money, EMS billing, as well as what we currently give Visa. And I, re I realize there's a lot of discussion on the EMS billing and percentage splits and, and items like that. But we have to keep in mind that the EMS billing uh, is the other half of funding that volunteers utilize to employ their, um, their people. Um, so that, that is a, a true picture, that $10.7 $11 million estimate of what it's costing to deliver the service that's currently in the field. And that's not counting operation, uh, operational costs as far as disposable supplies and station and apparatus maintenance. I, I kind of like scenario four better, but so uh, <laughs> that's kind of where I'm leaning yeah, towards. I, I like scenario four, it, yeah. not just because I brought it up. <laughs> it, it, only because you brought it up. Um, I, I'm still stuck on the one-time funding. Uh, I, I'm... I'm going to tell you, I don't, I don't I've, I've got to be talked into the fact that we should be buying all these ambulances. I, I'm just not there yet. Um, you know, have we, when we talk about what we have to do internally in order to support what we're doing here, you know, are guys in fleet ready to work on ambulances? Um, are we going to, are we going to, we're going to have to add somebody out there probably because these ambulances are on the road a lot. Who works on them now? They just go to private. Uh, okay, they take them. Yeah, because they own them. So they. Okay, each, just yeah, yeah. So each yeah. station just has someone, a okay. you know, someone that they trust to work on these things. But in a lot of cases, you, you can't just put a diesel mechanic to work on a on a on an ambulance because from the from the engine back to the to the box, great. Right. But from from the back seat all the way to the back of those ambulances, you're mm -hmm. talking about wiring, and 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 mm -hmm. all kinds of electronics, somebody that needs to be really uh, able to do that. And in many cases, these uh, individual stations will, will send the ambulance back to either the manufacturer mm -hmm. or someone uh, who the manufacturer has, has hired subcontract wise to work on these things. Because no disrespect to a diesel mechanic, but you, Man, that's tough. How often does that happen, though? I mean, well, I don't know. I, mean, I would think that you don't send them back there all the time just no. when there's a problem. And right. my guess is they're built pretty well, so you're not going to send them back that often. You want to weigh in on that one, Bob? Because you and I have talked about this one. I, yeah. I'm still not convinced that buying all these ambulances is the way to go. I just, I got a, I got a challenge with that. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. One, um, what, 
What I want to add is, is when you talk about, there's so many moving parts with this when you look through the operating budget. Um, even though we may uh, purchase the ambulances, we would continue to use the volunteer uh, vendors that they use. Uh, we would continue to use those vendors to work on those units. It's basically would still be in the operating budget. Um, I know for FY22 and possibly 23, that money would remain with the volunteers. Um, so basically, if we have not, uh, we have had talk with Public Works. We're not in a position for fleet to be working on any of our vehicles. So we would continue to use the private vendors for that. When you look at the EMS picture, um, you, you look at the cost and the gap of what the volunteers are paying and what they're subsidizing out of fundraising and what we're gonna be paying employees. The 100% funding uh, from the EMS uh, is critical to decreasing that gap. When you look at purchasing the ambulances, um, it is a one-time uh, purchase. We get them in the rotation, uh, but it's also a clean process for the, for the stations or for the county where with a split of revenue, we're gonna to have to track where that revenue is generated, who should get what percentage based on the call and make distributions. And I, I, I went through each station's call volumes and you know I, I'm looking at this from a neutral party, um, <laughs> you know, from post July. But when you look at this, if you take station X, uh, that's 36% of the EMS call volume uh, with a $1 million revenue pool to be split, they would get $360,000. Over five years, we would give them $1.8 million, yet the ambulances may last more than five years. And even after five years, they could replace, let's say three ambulances for $900,000. So we're looking at giving anywhere from six to $900,000 away in revenue. But as you go farther down the list, you have stations uh, that their call volume is small enough that even if they don't replace an ambulance for 10 years, they're still not going to generate enough revenue uh, with their percentage to purchase an ambulance. They're going to have to continue to fundraise. From the insurance perspective, the amount of money we pay to insure vehicles because we don't own them, this makes this a clean um, uh, break for the volunteers that they don't have to fundraise for ambulances. They don't have to maintain them, fuel them, repair them, anything, or insure them. And we can put the entire fleet in the replacement schedule and also on legit uh, insurance at a considerable savings. But bottom line, this all provides more revenue to the county to transition that burden of employment from the volunteers to the county. So it is a necessity, uh, in, in, in my opinion. Okay, that's that's a pretty good. Uh, I mean, you, I've heard some things there that I hadn't heard before, so mm -hmm. I, yes, I, you know, that 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 makes sense. Uh, maybe seeing that, well, I don't know. I always say I want to see it on paper, but <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, uh, that, was, I believe... that was very clear. I uh, appreciate it, um, Bob, what you just shared. Yeah, and uh, we certainly can put that on paper and make it one of the briefings um, here coming up. Um, so that that you feel you know you can make a decision on that and, and feel comfortable with it. Um, so, yeah, was, this, was this the last part of uh, your presentation, Bob? Was this okay? Thanks. <laughs> um, and there's yes, your sir. answer. Right? Yeah, no, I, I, I think um, I, I think Too late. You already asked all the questions. Direction yeah. that you know a handful of us were going was to do a deeper dive in both those courses of action three and four, um, you know, uh, or a more in-depth uh, look at them, um, I think would help us. And I, I, you know, would like to see uh, um, look or analysis on the part-time uh, situation and how, again, I just don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and right. They are, they are a staple in our community, um, you know, just like our volunteers. And I want to do what's right. So um, it doesn't mean holding on to people just to hold on to them, but it means right. to put them in a position of service in a community that they have served in many times for a long, 
time. So uh, I I would like to see that. But um, any, any other? Um, yeah, I think that's a good start. I really do. Uh, I think, Dennis, I, I agree with you on I think it, we should be focusing on personnel yeah. and not really stations. Uh, and, you know, I don't – in line with what you're saying, Ed, about the part-time people, uh, if you hire 44 people or whatever the number is and you see that there's a need at, at Union Bridge one day because they don't have anybody working part-time, then you can take one of those people because they're – they're county employees. Mm -hmm. They're not Westminster or Sykesville employees, and then put that person at Union Bridge so that you can that you can assist over there. So I think the emphasis has to be mm -hmm. on that. But with that, you're right. The the part timers have been an integral part of what we have done. I mean, it, we couldn't be where we are today without all of them. Actually, right, sure. so I don't know if we've ever done a breakdown, Bob. You may have because you're. You're all over this, as you should be, of course. But uh, do we do we know on, on these part-time people how many work for other – how many people are career in other places that just do this to supplement their income versus those that work for our stations that are considered full-time? I, I, I can get that breakdown for you. Uh, I don't have that number off the top of my head. I know it's a considerable amount. Okay. Uh, so yeah we could definitely work on that and i also know you know one of the things taylor and i had talked about before because we meet weekly um for a couple months now on this is that um when you start wanting to factor in over to um uh, part-timers where we were looking at potential overtime line item to for preparation that part-timer that part-timer factor can be looked at within that number itself so they would would offset each other so i can definitely work getting those numbers for you yeah and i think that that's also a, an additional reason to do this is to offset that overtime consideration so yeah. right okay so so where are we with the safer grants did we have to don't we have to put in for those by the 12th i think that's next uh so week. We're, okay so we're gonna so I, today I, was just sort of the the primer for <clears throat> the decision about safer for next week is that right I think it's on our agenda for next week for uh, okay. making a decision to okay, cool. apply. Right. So, yeah, if we could, is that on Tuesday or Thursday? And I don't, I don't have it. Well, um, yeah, I do have it, but it's on Tuesday, Thursday. T could stand for Tuesday on, or Thursday. It is on Give me it's something on more than a T. It's on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. so, I thought about that after I did it. Sorry. <laughs> so Bob, so Bob, Bob, and, Bob and Debbie are coming back to us on Tuesday at 945, not six, but five, to okay. request approval for the safer grant okay. application. All right. All right. So. Yeah, so maybe, maybe we could get – you don't have to get it right down to the number, <clears throat> Bob, but if we could have a little bit – better understanding of who who's who in the in the in the part-time mm -hmm. world versus who's actually yeah. considered full-time that might help too with that decision yeah. so that'd be great and yes, maybe a little bit better breakdown taylor of what those uh other uh expenses are you, you know give us a give us a little bit more uh uh specificity when it comes to what other means Okay, excellent. Okay, really appreciate your uh, your time. Great job, Taylor. Thank you very much, uh, Bob. And yes, please. Sorry, uh, just two things. Um, um, I think it will be helpful if you uh, if we send you these uh, spreadsheets, uh, spread send them to the board so you can look them over. And you know, it's hard to see them here and to really analyze yep. them, and you can't see them. You know, can't lay them all out next to each other, um, so I think that might be helpful to you, um, and um, in in making a decision because I see Ted's ringing in and um, uh, he wants to ask you something. Do you want to say it, Ted? Okay, yeah, and just on the question about more detail, I mean, uh, Taylor already has all the details. It's just there was no way to put all that on these spreadsheets in a in a easy to look at way. But on this idea of which option we want to pursue you don't have to make a decision today that right. can't change 
But if, if you do have a preference, if you could say today, this is where we think we're going, we can then use right. that in our, our, our fiscal plan. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, no, Ted, I think uh, you're absolutely right. We don't need to make a decision. We can make a decision if there are throwaways, which I believe one and two are throwaways, and getting more depth into three and four, but hi highlighting four, I think, is getting more attention uh, because it's more people-focused. Um, I don't want to speak out of turn amongst the other commissioners, but is there comments? I don't want to say anything. Which number I prefer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, does that does that help if we get it to fifty percent, Ted? Now, you, instead of one, two, three, and four, you've got three and four. So, well, not unless we're going to build two plans. Okay. Um, well, sometimes you know you need to have that comparison, and uh, you know, um, well, I, I, yeah, I got to say, I'm I like four. Yeah, I, I do. I like I like the emphasis on the personnel, as opposed right. to. I, and I like the fact that we start off with two stations, but we finish up quicker because we're working the personnel yeah. instead, of, instead of just stations. So maybe we are ready to give them a little direction on that, Ed. I don't know. Yeah, no, I I, I definitely want to be people focused, and if that's what the course of action four is going to allow us to do, and <clears throat> to focus on other resources like the part time. Uh, resources, then sure, I'm I'm all for it. Um, I'm not ready to. Be all for. So, yeah. I, I, I'm for four. <laughs> we will build it, okay, Commissioner Weaver. I like four. Uh, okay. But keep in mind, we have to have a be very methodical how we go through this, and yeah. you know these little part time and how they fit together is going to be very difficult for us. So. Uh, but I do like four, I think, of all of them. Okay. Okay. And I saw Commissioner Boucher, you shared as well. Um, you know, in doing this, just let's move forward. Uh, also be prepared to, you know, adjust appropriately as uh, you have been doing. And I uh, really appreciate the uh, this dialogue. I think we're moving in the right direction uh, through a lot of work being done. So, okay. Anything else for this the this yes. just helps um, staff set up the recommended budget. So, that well, in that case, in that case, we're not going to make a decision. No, then no, yeah. I don't want to help staff. Forget, forget it. I'm back yeah. to two, three, and four yeah. now. No, I think two, three, and four are all good. In I fact, thought option five. Yeah, good where, where's five and six? Option five. So, Roberta, you know when you <laughs> they say when you make the sale, stop selling. That's right. And uh, the sale had been made. Um, so let's move on with four. <laughs> but understand. Okay, really appreciate it. Okay, let's move on, Bob. And again, Taylor, thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about submitting a grant for the Carroll County Regional Airport. And I should have Eric, Mark, and Debbie. Let's see. I got one. I got two. I got three. Who wants to start? Debbie, you want to start? Like, I'll defer to Public Works. Okay. They can they can handle this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead, Mark. Okay, yeah, if if Eric if Eric's okay with that. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, good morning. As a result of the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriation Act (CRRSA), the airport has the opportunity to apply for a grant in the amount of twenty three thousand dollars to help offset any airport operational expenses and any extra expenses relating to the coronavirus pandemic. The FAA has requested the money be secured under the grant as quickly as possible. Deadline is June 30th of this year. Once we have been awarded the grant, we have four years to spend it. However, the FAA is encouraging recipients to spend the funds as expeditiously as possible. We're here today to request your approval to submit the CRRSA grant application and approve the acceptance of the grant in the amount of $23,000 for the Carroll County Regional Airport. Okay. Any uh, discussion? Why 23? Because it couldn't get 24. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you think. Good question, commissioners. Uh, 
we're, we are identified in the National Plan of Integrated Airport Systems as a regional airport. All regional airports in, the, in that plan uh, have been given the $23,000 mark. Okay. So your answer was, was partially correct. Pretty close. <laughs> so, so I, guess, I guess the answer is why wouldn't we do this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, is there a reason we would not go after this grant? I don't think so. I can't know no, that I'm aware of. of. Yeah, so, I mean, this this cover any any uh, funds that the airport spends as operational dollars. So, we can certainly spend that in place of the money that we would typically spend for operations. So, we, we can't think of a reason not to accept this grant. All right, okay. then I'll make the motion the Board of County Commissioners approve the submittal of the Coronavirus Response and Release Supplemental Appropriation Act grant application and approve acceptance of the grant for the Carroll County Regional Airport. Second. I got a motion and I got a second. Okay, any further discussion, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we got 5 0. Thank you, gentlemen and Ms. Debbie. And now let's talk about Thank the. You. Thank you. Thank you. Consolidated Transportation Plan Priority Letter. Ms. Eisenberg, there you are. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. So I'm here again before you today to review the letter that we prepared for you. I sent it up last week and put incorporated the changes that was discussed at our last meeting. So we're here to review this today and see if it um, gets your approval that we can now begin to work with Mike Fowler to have the delegation um, also endorse the letter and send it to Secretary Slater at Maryland Department of Transportation. So I can just share my screen for a moment, please. I'm just gonna run through just a couple things with you. See that. So again, we were here before you two weeks ago reviewing this year's Consolidated Transportation Program County Priority Letter. Again, just the purpose of the letter and the presentation is to review the process, update the letter, review the proposed changes, and talk about timing and next steps and to answer any questions you might have. <clears throat> So again, just very quickly, this is the list of the state transportation priorities for the county. That includes state highways, streetscapes, county trails, and transit. So in the timing and coordination, we are at the review and approval of the letter so that we can try to get this to MDOT by April. So we have four capacity enhancing projects in the letter. Maryland 32, which has been a long-standing project, Maryland 26 to the Carroll County line for dualization, Maryland 97, Bachman Valley Road um, to Maryland 140 in the Westminster area, Maryland 26, which is from Maryland 32 east to the Liberty Reservoir, and added last year as an additional priority is Maryland 140 corridor improvements from the county line to Case Mill Road. And again, these are all outlined as one, two, three, and four in your letter. So for this year, the Maryland 32 project, the priorities continue to be the same as well as the breakout projects. There were no new breakouts associated for this year, but we're hoping to continue to work on moving these forward in future years. And that was the breakout project for engineering design of Piney Ridge Parkway from Macbeth Way North of Springfield Avenue, Maryland 851, which is also a future project that we have in the list for urban reconstruct. And then another breakout project for design funding, Second Street to Main Street. So these projects are outlined and identified on page two and three of the letter that you have in front of you. And again, here's just a scope of the project. <laughs> from the Howard County line, just south of Maryland 26. Now, parts of this has already been dualized throughout the process. So we're looking for full dualization to the county line eventually, and that is the total outcome of this project. Maryland 97, Bachman's Valley Road to Maryland 140 in Westminster. There's been a great deal of work already done on this stretch of roadway, a successful breakout project, um, was the safety resurfacing improvement from South of Airport Drive and Magna Way, just north of Pleasant Valley. 
So we are gonna remove this from the ladder, but this is building upon this. And now the next step is, is to request a feasibility study for this project. What this does in working with State Highway Administration is make it eligible for Chapter 30 scoring. Chapter 30 scoring is important because that's how Maryland Department of Transportation identifies projects to move forward in the CTP for capacity enhancement. So that's why it's important that we try to really get them to do a feasibility study upcoming in the next few years. Also working with Department of Public Works, they're recommending the beginning of land acquisition for the remaining portion of the project so we can secure those rights of way for the future. This is outlined on page three, number two, in that paragraph talking about the additional needs for the stretch of roadway. That, well, Linda, hold on. A that, that, that section of roadway, we're, we're focusing on the whole, the whole section, right, Linda? Including Correct. the, including the Magna Way uh, that's already been, been done, but just on both that what we're looking at is on both ends of it then the 140 Correct. end and the the um pleasant valley to bachman valley end of it to make all of that th that way correct and what we're okay. really wanting to do is get this feasibility study done um and working with state highway so that way we can begin to move this project forward um to make it eligible for that chapter 30 scoring which we have not been able to do to this point yeah I wonder if there, and the reason I asked that question is because I'm wondering if the, if, and I don't want to change the letter now. I, I know we're past that, oh, but we no, could. But absolutely, uh, there's still. The point, that's what we're here again today. Okay, the section from 140 to Magna Way. Uh, I know they're getting ready to put a Royal Farms out there at the, um, what's the name of the industrial park out there, yeah. Dennis? Yeah, I, I mean, know. I that, can't that, it, yeah. You. you, you insert mess here <laughs> i mean that's going to be a mess i don't know what they're planning on doing there but maybe we could emphasize that because of that because of that coming that maybe Let's the see. focus should be the right, priority should be that, that portion point, yeah. of it uh and maybe there's already plans in place because i, I know you can't just drop a rural farms in anywhere i guess right. without mm -hmm. the right infrastructure mm -hmm. maybe there's already plans in place there to assist with that but you know go out there at four o'clock in the afternoon and you're going to put a royal farms there now right <laughs> so so let me reach out to development review um and just double check to see if they have anything for the site plan regarding this section so that way we can see if there are any mitigation um efforts that have been recommended as part of that site plan approval. So I'm not aware, yeah. but I will double check that uh, particular section to make sure that we're covering all our bases. Yeah, maybe mm -hmm. just to maybe just to prioritize that section of it <clears throat> over over the other part of it would be a good thing. Uh, you know, because uh, I don't know, they have good chicken and they have the best <laughs> coffee in the world, right? So Plus, I don't know. You know, if you look at that road, it, like you said, four o'clock or five o'clock in the afternoon, that's yeah. where all the bottleneck is, is right yeah. in that section. Right. Because with that improvement that they made, I'm so amazed at how well that works. That improvement that they made when you get past here, it's not really as bad. It, it, exactly. Yeah. Dennis, I agree with you. You and I both talked about this and said, how in the world is that going to help? Right. Well, it did. Yeah. But it's, and, and also in the morning, because I guess folks are going to want to take a left that are coming out of the northbound or whatever that is, westbound, what eastbound, yeah, say, yeah, uh, whatever it is, yep. to get into the ROFO. Yeah. Something's got to give there. I don't know. So anyway, enough about ROFO, but that's <laughs> that that's a that that's a genuine concern. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will work on that and um, we can incorporate that into the letter. Um, the next is Maryland 26 from Maryland 32 east of the Liberty Reservoir. This has been a longstanding project. Um, it is in the CTP, but currently unfunded. We do have some breakout projects to propose um, for moving forward based on a recent Maryland 26 study that was approved by um, this body several months ago that we came forward with the state that we had worked with State Highway Administration on. So again, uh, in reference to the bullets on the screen, in July of 2020, State Highway did complete the Maryland 26 corridor study traffic analysis and target 
adaptive improvement recommendations to look at the redesign of Maryland 26 and to reconfigure the 30% design that was already uh, finalized, I believe in 2005, 2006. So again, rather than complete widening of the six lane improvements, it will consist of a more limited breakout projects. Um, and this may be achieved through the extension as we discussed before, auxiliary lanes, increased signalization and a center median segment. So this is the complete stretch on the map that I'm showing you the orange line that is for the entire scope of the Maryland 26 project. On this slide is the um, breakout project that we are recommending be included for this year's priority letter. And that is to convert the eastbound Maryland 26 right turn only lane at Georgetown Boulevard. And the purpose of the project is to increase safety and operations at this intersection. The project is to extend the lane back to Eldersburg Crossing and west to Homeland Drive. And the next slide is a map so you can see where this is located. And the scope of the project is almost entirely within existing right of way and will allow conversion of the right turn only lane at Eldersburg Crossing to a through lane. Um, and now the project, as all the projects along Maryland 26 include sidewalk, and this will be from Carroll Bank to Georgetown Boulevard. And the initial cost estimate as proposed by State Highway Administration is $6 million. And so here's a map of the scope of um, the project. And this would help with that Homeland Drive. And this would be a proposed median and proposed sidewalk improvements. So as this project moves forward, we'll have more detailed drawings, but this is just the estimate, estimated drawing of the design from that Maryland 26 plan. And if you recall, Terry Susan, State Highway Administration representatives did come and give you a detailed report um, on the Maryland 26 corridor redesign. So this is what we would be recommending is an initial breakout since it's well delineated and has a dollar amount associated with it and was one of the first projects mentioned in this report as a breakout. Um, and then next, this was added uh, last year to the priority letter um, and it's Maryland 140 corridor improvements from County Line to Kays Mill and an initial breakout project um, that's also in the letter uh, we're requesting design funding for the intersection following the recent completion of a concept study to evaluate this jug handle design for westbound traffic. And that's something that State Highway has been working on for several years. So we're hoping to continue with that momentum and have improvements along the stretch of roadway. And again, here is a map of the scope of the project and the circle delineates the jug handle and intersection improvements that are long overdue in the stretch of Maryland 140. Mm. Um, another change for this year's letter is just the reordering of these two projects, Maryland 851, the Sykesville Main Street Springfield Avenue project and the Maryland 31 New Windsor Main Street High Street. The reason for the rankings is the importance of moving forward with Maryland 851 for the improvements that are happening with drainage and the sewer underground work that the county is working on to make sure that we can time any resurfacing and road improvements to those infrastructure upgrades that are much needed in the Sykesville area. So again, a concept has been completed for this project for the Maryland 851, but it's not currently funded for design. So we wanna to try to move that forward. Um, one of the major a milestone in this was getting the Maryland 851 road classification upgraded from a local, major, local road to a major collector. And now this will make it more competitive for federal money. The bookends of the stretch of Maryland 851 are considered a major collector, but the middle section where the project um, scope is was not. So this will help, and this was recommended by State Highway Administration, MDOT, and we worked with the town and them to change this, and the federal government uh, did send a letter recently approving the upgrade of this classification. And again, another breakout project is to address storm drain replacement for us, as I just spoke about. And again, here is the scope of this project in its entirety and the orange. And then again, the Maryland 31 New Windsor Main Street High Street 
continuing to put this project in that will include improvements to sidewalks, enhancements to bike pet accessibility and roadway improvements. And this would be coordinated um, with the town's replacement of water lines. Um, and I'm not sure quite the status of this, but I know it's not moving as quickly um, as they had thought it once was. So we'll continue to work with the town on progressing this project forward. And the orange again delineates the scope of this project. Um, again, some new items for transit that were part of our discussion last time um, is that this request will be identical to the annual transportation plan that transit completes yearly um, and the request for 2022 um, in your document. You can see that they have asked um, for additional replacement buses, preventative maintenance funding, as well as funding for extended hours for the trail blazer routes. Um, and so that again is continuing to be asked for, as well as, oh, I apologize, new language um, that we look at outside of the annual transportation plan because it was not delineated in that, that we are also looking at the early planning stages of preparing for alternative fuel vehicles along with supporting infrastructure. And this is something that Commissioner Frazier mentioned as we move some of our fleets to other alternative modes of fueling that we look at having the infrastructure in place for those buses. Very happy to see that in there. Absolutely. Um, again, continuing to put forward our two trail projects, the Governor Frank Brown Trail, which has been a longstanding project. Um, we've been working uh, with Breck and Park on this and they've been very actively involved in making sure that um, whatever happens will happen, um, including the trail portion that was to go near the readiness center. So Jeff Diggitz is very much on top of this, as well as the Westminster Community Trail Project. Again, these were uh, longstanding projects that we continue to move forward until their completion. Which one is number one? Because on the paper I have, it says Westminster Community Trail is number one. Um, then that is correct. I'm sorry, I, I did not switch that in the presentation, so okay. I apologize. Okay. The, le the letter is the priority. Thank you All for right. saying something. Okay, thank you. Um, and then finally, uh, in more detail, obviously, than the slide shows, we did add in the two new discussion points that we had for Maryland 31 Medford Road and Maryland 26 Johnsville. Um, the Medford Road, as I said before, this will be an assessment of safety concerns at this intersection. We have already reached out to our district engineer, Terry Seuss, to see what she can pull together. In speaking with State Highway, as opposed to actually being um, one of the capacity enhancing projects, this would really be that same funding source that we use for Maryland 27 at Gillis Falls, but using that safety funding programmatic money that State Highway has would be best applied to this intersection. So State Highway is aware and we're gonna be working with them to continue to see what improvements can be made um, after they do an assessment of the stretch of Maryland 31 as well as we're requesting a study of the safety concerns at the intersection of Maryland 26 and Johnsville Road. We know that was a concern of Commissioner Rothstein's, so that is something that we're also including in the letter and we'll be reaching out just as part of our interactions with State, Way, State Highway Administration to address that roadway. And they are very aware of that of those concerns as well. So again, um, I know there's some changes that want to be made out of today's discussion. So we will work on those for you. Um, the idea is we would like to get approval of the letter from you and your signature. So that way we can pass it on to Mike Fowler to get delegation support. And um, it doesn't have to be there by April, but we'd like to try to get it there as close to April 1st as possible to the secretary at NDOT. So with that, are there any questions? And um, please let me know what additional changes you would like to see in the letter based on today's conversation. I think there was just the one adjustment that was requested, right? At the 140. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, 97. 97. On 97. Yeah. I mean, and did you yeah, say please. that? I think I saw an email from you, Linda, that uh, the Running Need Elementary School issue at 140 in Mayberry, that's in the queue. So it doesn't have that to be on this letter. That, yes, that is already something they're working on again through that safety funding. And so, yes, they are, we've afforded you everything that I have received from the district engineer. Okay, so mm -hmm. there's, not a, there's not a need to list it on this letter, just to remind them? I don't them. believe 
So, because they're already very aware and already have um, a project in, in line up for that. And that's on a capacity enhancing. So again, those are those safety funds that will be used for that project. Okay. If you'd like to add it in, we can always do that. They're just to reaffirm that. If you want to add that in um, into the document, I'm happy to do that as well. Yeah, I think you should so that it doesn't get lost in the shuffle. Put it, okay. Yeah, put, it, put it in the end where we're talking about yeah, the safety the, project. Right, at the end. right. Absolutely. And you can make that the last one so it's easy yeah. to throw it in there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think so. That, we'll go ahead and yeah, do that. Out of sight, out of mind sometimes yeah, for these projects. Absolutely. And you're talking about the sidewalk? Well, this, no, this is to yeah. add the, the, the right turn lane up oh, there at 140 in Mayberry got it. Okay. to get into the elementary school right. because okay. it's a mess up there. Yep. Okay. Uh, just um, just a thought as we move ahead on these, you know, when we did the Gillis Road intersection, we put about 300000 of county money, I think, into the planning to get expedite that and get it started. Uh, this year, looking ahead, as we look into budget, we are going to have a, some one-time money coming about that we hadn't anticipated. It may be worth tying a couple dollars into some of these projects that we really feel need to get moving at a, a faster rate. So just something to think about as we uh, move into budget to help uh, push some of these along. Well, I understand that we have about $200,000 less than left in that fund that we put that money aside for. And if we're going to use it, I would like to see it used for some of these safety concerns. But we we don't have to talk about that now, right. but it's just yeah. something I, you know, if we're going to use it for safety. While this is fresh in your mind, just think about your priority projects. So why don't we um, make the adjustments, Linda, as directed, and then let's get it on the agenda for Tuesday for decision, uh, just for us to review the letter itself, not going through a presentation, and then with a decision for approval, okay? Okay, sounds good. I will get that sent up to you by the end of the week for your review. I'd like okay. to thank you for all the changes Great. that you've made so far. And they, they reflect what, what we said. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you for your time this morning, and we'll see you on Tuesday with those changes. Okay, let's uh, move on with uh, Mr. Jack Lyburn, and let's talk about the Harrison Leisure property. Jack, you may want to fix the camera so we see more than just your nose and forehead. I okay. you go. My tie, my eyes okay. Yeah. I, I was going to say you had a face for radio, but can't say it now, so keep just, going. Just for the record, I kind of liked it before. <laughs> <laughs> Is that better? That's a lot better. That's, That's right. <laughs> you guys will miss me. Yeah. <laughs> the Harrison Lyshare yeah. property. It's uh, it's. Roughly about 255 acres. Uh, the property is located um, in the county, and it's zone R40, uh, or you know, 40,000. The land has really high visibility. It's located along 27, and it's close to Washington, of course, DC, and the Frederick Market, and it's only about five miles away from um, I-70. The, the um, the, the county uh, gave the property, deeded the property to the, the um, Industrial Development Authority a little over 10 years ago. Um, they requested it and elected not to pursue the annexation and development of the Harrison Lakeshore property. And uh, they are requesting that the county accept the property back. You, you have the copy of the deed. We notified um, the uh, Mount Airy on February the 5th that we were not going to pursue the annexation of the property or pursue the project. He sent that to the town. Um, per the policy, the county, um, if you have to, you have to uh, deem it the portion of the property surplus. And my recommendation is that it's approximately, like I said, 255 acres that we, we deem surplus 169 acres surplus and an 85 acre parcel, you know, you have the map there that, it, you know, has constraints and has environmental issues and factors in topo. Therefore, I recommend the parcel remain under county ownership that we would put out the RFP out for 169 acres, which we know is developable land and the county keep the um, 85 acres uh, of land. Now, to do that, 
you know, you're going to have to uh, solicit bids from minister interested parties and the acquisition development of property, but you have to deem it surplus the, uh, you know, the, the property. So I'm re I'm recommending that you deem surplus the, uh, the 169 acres of the 254 acres uh, of that and allow us to, um, like you've done in the past, to um, put an RFP out to developers and let them come back, show them, let us see a master plan, what they're going to do, design sketches, and then, you know, the financing piece of the property. So I guess that's what I'm asking you for, to uh, deem it's surplus the, uh, the 169 acres and the county keep the 85 acres, allow us to put it out. Okay. Any uh, thoughts, questions, comments in moving forward? If there is none, I'd like to make the motion. I move the county commissioners retain the plus or minus 85 acres of land that was originally designed to remain as publicly owned land to be used for public purpose and approved to selling the remaining 169 acres previously designated for development by seeking requests for proposals while retaining all monitoring and production wells and access thereto. Okay, I have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I will second that motion. I mean, it gives us an opportunity and uh, IDA walked away from it, so it's surplus property. Okay, so does this fit? Or yeah, maybe I better ahead. rephrase the question. How does the town of Mount Airy feel about? Do we do we know how they would feel about this this recommended direction? They rather it not go in this direction. They rather it go back into the IDA okay. for them Mount Airy to retain opportunity and receiving revenue from that property. Okay. The IDA had it for over ten years and walked away from it. It is now surplus property, or at least 169 of the 255 acres is surplus to now be developed in accordance with what it's zoned. And it gives us, the county, the opportunity to reach out and get that property developed in accordance with what it's zoned. Okay. So that's, yeah, I'm just I mean, that, that's, that, that is, your, but you're right. The, the town as the, uh, Councilman um, talked a couple of weeks ago. Right, was relatively animate, along with the others, to to work with the IDA for the IDA to come back and retain that property. The IDA has no interest, from my understanding, in retaining that property. So, Jack and the economic team is coming up with a solution of how to, you know, okay. use that property, use that land. Yeah, I just have a question about the wells that are the monitoring mm -hmm. wells. What are they? What are they monitoring? <laughs> Why are they on the property? So Go ahead, wells. So wells. Um, you always know too. There's a, a real well that would um, the water would come from it, um, when you draw water from it, and then there's a monitoring well that can watch that well. I'd have to have Tom Devilbiss give you a lot better but, explanation than that. Right, but that's but, about but there's as deep no, as I I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry to cut you off, but there's no, um, I guess, problem that we're aware of. They're just that that's just standard procedure to have a well and a monitoring well. Absolutely. That's that's, 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 that's normal. normal. That's correct. <clears throat> but, but but the good thing that's that being put in here, and the motion the way it is, is that those wells are protected. Right. Yeah. And kept underneath the county and not. Right. And I know, understand that. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't something near like nope. there was. An old landfill there, or there's nope. something radioactive, or you know what I mean. It, it's kind of typical stuff, to so. have the two wells. We're good. We have in Sykesville. Um, yeah, so this uh, this allows the county to go after and uh, to potential opportunities to occupy the property and purchase the property and develop it in accordance with the way it's zoned. And we know of large developers that would like this property because of its location. Um, you know, do it. No, that better way. We believe there are developers that would want to develop on this property. So, 
Okay. Uh, in order for them to do that, we have to take this next step. Yeah, I understand all that. I, I, I know we can't have land out there in limbo. Right. Uh, yeah, I just, I, in, the, in, in the interest of making sure that we work and with our municipalities because they are what they are, they make us mm -hmm. what we are. Absolutely. I just want to make sure that this would be a, a viable alternative that they can work with as well and that they'll be part of this uh, this discussion moving forward on whatever happens there. I don't want to, I don't want to, to I don't want to alienate them right. from right. the discussions of what we're going to do. I, I just want to be clear that we're merely taking the property back so that we can entertain those viable alternatives mm -hmm. working with Mount Airy. Right, working with Mount Airy, but us having control of it. And I think we'll right. have to work with Mount Airy. Right. right. I just don't want that I mean, to get lost in the equation here. Exactly. Correct. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think um, a lot of discussion has been had uh, bringing Mount Airy into the conversations um, with the IDA, with our team. Um, the IDA made their decision. Now that they made their decision, something has to be done with that property. And right. that's okay. where we're okay. at. Is, am I misstepping this or misstating this, uh, Jack? Uh, no, you're on target. Okay. If I so. may add, you know, I, I appreciate all my colleagues giving not only clarification, but expressing their concerns. And also, I want the public to know that whatever path is chosen with the purchaser, there'll, there'll be public hearings and, and input. You know, everyone's not out of the equation, so to speak. And even the town, everyone's going to want to weigh on whatever happens in the future with this property. Sure. I just want to make sure the public understands that we're not closing the door on them, that their voices and concerns will always be heard by not only us as commissioners, particularly me since it's my district, but also the officials within the town of Man Airy. So thank you, Jack, for what you're doing. I appreciate my colleagues for expressing their concerns as well. We're just putting the RFP out. I, you know, I personally have no idea, you know, who's going to, you know, answer it or what they're going to come back with a program. But we, you know, of course, you know, it'll, we'll give them about five or six weeks to come back and then we'll present everything to you. But uh, whoever comes in, it's a long process. They're going to have to jump through a lot of hoops and a lot of meetings, you know, and through the county here. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a, good piece of property it's you know like i said it's close to 70 it's one of the best pieces we have in the county and only five miles away and it, you know the, the topos you know fairly it's good topo to develop and you know and we need good you know uh economic development property and this is a this is a really good piece of property to develop okay. i just like to see what's out there with developers you know what their plans would be for so. Any uh, further questions, discussion? This is a very important uh, piece of property. It's a very important decision we're making. Okay. Seeing and hearing none, I have a motion and a second on the floor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We got 5 0. <clears throat> Let's move on. Thanks, Jack. Commissioners, thank you. <clears throat> Do I have. Uh, any callers? I believe we have one caller. Okay, just a reminder for callers, uh, you have <clears throat> uh, approximately three minutes to share uh, what you wanna share, what you wanna say. It is not a time for dialogue between the commissioners and the caller. It doesn't take away the fact that we retain the information, we discuss afterwards and we follow up appropriately. So, with that said, uh, identify the caller. Caller, if you could please state your name. Yes. Hi, uh, yes. Again, uh, my name is Michael Weiner, uh, 589 Sunshine Way in Westminster. Um, calling back once again uh, to try and work on a resolution for our known uh, speeding issue on our street. Um, a couple of things I'd like to say. Um, first of all, um, it seems like the timing of your meetings uh, during typical working hours make it uh, very difficult um, for the rest, for many of my uh, neighbors um, who have full-time jobs to, 
to attend and to, to, to uh, participate uh, in their views. Um, so I am requesting that the, the Board of Commissioners dedicate at least one day, one Thursday or Tuesday out of the month that you have meetings in the evening um, as opposed to having just standard nine or 10 o'clock meetings. So that way uh, other people can participate uh, on the topics that uh, may concern them or they may uh, want to you know, be a part of. Uh, secondly, I want to let it be known that on the record that um, I called last Thursday on the 25th to the um, county administrator's office seeking uh, information about being placed on the agenda, our issue. Um, I left a message to be called back. I had not been called back. Uh, so nobody ever got in touch with me, which again, then on this past Monday <clears throat> night, I sent an email to each one of you commissioners, as well as the county administrator, seeking again information about being placed on the agenda. Uh, it was not known to me at the time, uh, and you could tell via the, you know, in that email that I had no idea that you had intentions of speaking about this on Tuesday, the following day. Nobody responded to let me know that, and I feel that um, uh, that was very unprofessional. And, uh, you know, many of my emails, actually all of my emails in the past, uh, in the recent past, have not been responded to, uh, and it's it's very frustrating. So. Um, I feel that uh, it, it seems like there's a coordinated effort to silence, you know, the residents of Sunshine Way uh, in, instead of trying to work with us. So let the record uh, state that uh, the commissioners have not responded to any uh, emails in the last at least four weeks um, pertaining to this issue to myself and, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, my neighbors. Um, that being said, I'd like to request an evening. Um, I heard this earlier on a town hall meeting. I think it's a great idea. Uh, I'd like to have request a town hall meeting on this issue in, uh, during an evening where a uh, community can respond to, uh, Mr. Lenonchin, uh, made some statements. Uh, I watched on the video of Tuesday's meeting, uh, that, um, I think, um, Confusing and contradicting to other conversations that um, have had, you know, have had, I've had, I've had with him uh, in the past, and uh, you know, I've never had the opportunity to be part of a discussion uh, amongst the board, and then uh, it seems everybody else that got a chance to speak today gets a chance to come on and, and speak and talk, and um, you know, if it's what you all want to hear, then you're happy to have them on and and help push, but. You know, my children's safety is at risk here, and, and I can't sit back, and neither can my neighbors, and just, you, you know, let this go away. So we produced a petition that was signed, no response. We have sent emails requesting documentation and data from the county, no response. We request, you know, to be part of um, a, a conversation on the record, no response. You have put something on, didn't respond, or let anybody know uh, that has been asking for this. Sir, I understand now your, that there's. Please finish up your comments. I understand now that, that you put up a, an agenda. I don't know when that's posted, and this is all new to most of us people. We're not, you know, in this line of work, or this is a regular tool. So please listen to what I have to say, and uh, you know, also changing the rules as we go is something that's not appreciated. Also, so. Um, that's all I have to say, and I'll be back again next time to see what kind of responses that I'm hoping somebody may be able to provide to our situation. Thank yes, you. sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, open admin at this point. Any, uh, any comments? I, I, I will say in open admin, uh, Commissioner Frazier, I did uh, read your letter to those on Sunshine Way. I think that was sent out the 15th or 17th of January. And as I was reviewing some of the emails from Mr. Weiner and what he shared, I was thinking, what else could I add? And what you wrote in your letter covered the information. So um, effective communications, let's make sure that this continues to get out there. But uh, you covered 
all of the questions that are being asked. Um, and I'm not, it's not a sense of applauding you, but it's a sense of how do we get the information to those where it's going to resonate? And I couldn't think of another way, um, but, and this is, it happens to be such a way, but this is across the county and that's why traffic calming procedures are very important to discuss and uh, the efforts um, on how to reach out to the community. So, um, yeah, yeah, please. I mean, I want to add to that. Uh, the, the agenda item was not about Sunshine Way right. last week. The agenda item was put on our schedule uh, because, and I think I'm, maybe I'm the one that asked for it. I wanted to know what procedures and processes are in right. place when these types of uh, requests are made to us. Right. So uh, there might be a misunderstanding there. That was not uh, the Sunshine Way agenda item. It was the Correct. traffic calming process and procedure that we use in Carroll County, and uh, I, you know, I get sometimes that people are frustrated. What I don't get is some of the rudeness that comes out with some of the comments that are made. Uh, but that, I guess, that goes with the territory. But I want to make that clear, and I, because I mm -hmm. think I'm the one that asked for that. Right. I wanted to know what the process was right. when anybody in the county, anywhere, asks for um, something like that to occur. So right. yeah, I and, want that and to I be think, clear. Yeah, because I right, get I a lot to, of being older. I, I, right. I, I, right. I get a lot of folks concerned about speeding. Concerned right. about I've had the, a ton of them in my yeah. district. So, yeah. So I wanted a refresher because yeah. I don't. Right. Know. And and I apologize because during that discussion, I mentioned Sunshine right. Way because it's the one that's in my district that right. I'm talking about. But it was put on to see right. what the procedure was and how, and how we do things and refresh what you know what we do. And I did mention Sunshine Way because it's the one that right. kind of I'm concerned with right right now. And, uh, yep. okay. and like but, I said. But, middle of January, the, the letter that you shared highlighted those processes um, and, and specifically saying that, and we were told by state, not by us, stop signs are not to be used as a viable option for traffic mitigation or uh, actually the they feds, calming. It starts at the federal so, level. Right. If, right yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so that, that's okay. not an option. But okay. anyway, that's, that, that's for me sharing open admin. Is there anything else for open admin? Uh, Commissioner Boucher? I just want to very quickly state that for the public that since we are commissioners elected by district, we do try our best to ex exercise, you know, district courtesy. If, if a constituent calls in someone else's district, it's proper for us to refer to that commissioner and not overstep our bounds and only get involved when we're brought in. So I just want to make sure that people understand that. Anything else? Open admin. Okay, seeing none, we have closed minutes from uh, February 25th that need uh, review and uh, approval. I move we approve the minutes, closed minutes from uh, February 25th, 2021. Second. Okay, I got a motion and second. Any comments? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, five zero. Uh, I apologize, Roberta. Did you have anything for open admin? Okay, let's go into uh, agendas. It's incredible. We're going into the middle of March. Uh, March eighth, on Monday, we have a transit advisory council meeting with Commissioner Fraser attending. On Tuesday, we're going to have open session starting at nine o'clock with Mr. Fowler, our legislative liaison, kicking it off. Then we'll be talking about pop mix asphalt paving. Always exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Um, <laughs> that is exciting. And, <laughs> and then we will be talking about the safer grant application. Looking forward to that with uh, Mr. McCoy. Um, we will have a budget overview at 955, uh, scheduled 955 on Tuesday. This is really starting to kick off the budget season for us. Uh, so Mr. Zaleski, will have us, I think that'll take about five, 10 minutes. At 1 p.m. <laughs> at 1 p.m. that afternoon is the Bullfrog Road Bridge Replacement Site Visit in Tawny Town and Commissioner Boucher will be attending that. I may be joining him because I always get very antsy when he comes into my district. Well, he has to get a green card to get up there. Well, there's permissions so, that yeah. are required, yes. Right. I don't think they've been signed yet, working on that. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> you know, it's a camera crew. It's, 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 a it's a six hour visa, but we'll work on that. Uh, okay, Carroll County 
COVID-19, oh, we got the uh, town hall meeting at 5 p.m. where uh, Mr. Singer will join me uh, and should be 5 to about 7 p.m. And then at the at 7 p.m. I have the Ag Center board meeting and that is tentative for me. I may talk with one of the others to attend that if I feel like it's going to be going over with the town hall. On Wednesday, uh, really looking forward to a, a new business coming into uh, Carroll County, into Westminster, 310. It's called 310, tempering, tempering. And it's a ribbon cutting where Commissioner Frazier and I will be attending. What, what is that? They're a, a business that's coming out of Kentucky, and it's a, uh, I believe, a manufacturing. Oh, uh, I know it's, manu it's like manufacturing, I know it is. But it's, yeah. um, where's it at at this? Significant. The airport area? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. And uh, they are bringing a lot of jobs, and uh, we may be also getting uh, attendance from the administration coming up for that as well. I so, think it's 80, 80 jobs, if I have it right. Yeah, it's either 75 or 80 jobs coming in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so really looking forward to that, that ribbon cutting. Uh, Governor's Workforce Development Board, I will be attending at 3.30 on Wednesday. The Carroll County Board of Education, Commissioner Weaver is so fortunate to be attending that at 5 p.m. And then the Winfield Volunteer Fire Company Board meeting, Commissioner Boucher will be attending at 7 p.m. On Thursday, we have open sessions starting at 9 a.m. We will go through our typical uh, discussion on staying state directives. Uh, Mr. Singer will be talking. We will also be talking about uh, extending the state of emergency at that time. Uh, fire and EMS uh, updates from Mr. McCoy. Look, really looking forward to uh, having a discussion on a community needs assessment survey by Ms. Uh, Dorothy Fox, uh, who is the Partnership for Healthier Carroll County. We will be talking about the FY22 submission uh, from the Office of the Problem Solving Courts, and we will be joined by Judge Hecker for that. Um, Carroll County Library is going to be requesting some funds for repairs on their roof, and then we're going to get a highlight uh, dis or a, a discussion highlighting the Exploration Commons, taking a little bit further than where uh, Commissioner Frazier right. talked about. I have this to morning. say that if I sorry, I don't interrupt you, Please. but this roof yeah. uh, repair is that was found out because of doing the exploration oh, commons okay. and they had to put to looking to put HVAC on top. And so anyway, they, they discovered a few things that they need to, to fix so that, that this project can move along. Okay. And then, uh, 11 third, well, excuse me, uh, next will be a proposed amendments to chapter 34, our ethics code, uh, will be discussed. And then, uh, I one industrial one text amendment, for Eldersburg Business Park will be also discussed and looking for approval. Ms. Eisenberg and Jack and Tom will be there to talk about that. And nothing on Friday, Saturday. I apologize this uh, past Sunday or the, this upcoming Sunday, Commissioner Boucher has the podcast and I have the podcast for March 14th. And let's see. Okay, the following week, March 15th, nothing, 16th on Tuesday, Crimgold Park site visit by Commissioner Boucher, planning and zoning uh, commission meeting, Commissioner Wance will be attending, Piney Run Nature Center site visit by Commissioner Boucher, and then Commissioner Weaver and I will be attending the Veterans Advisory Council at 2 p.m. On Wednesday, uh, Commissioner Wance will be attending the Community College Board of Trustees meeting. And then on Thursday, we have open session starting at 9 a.m. Uh, typical uh, discussions and updates we'll be having from legislative, fire EMS, uh, health department. There'll be a request for approval uh, for FY22 submission mediation and conflict resolution office grant again, uh, being joined by Judge Hecker for looking at that grant. Uh, we'll get a request for approval for the submission of the FY22 local management, local management community partnership agreement and acceptance of the award. Okay. By, uh, citizen services. We'll look at, uh, exercise an option to purchase some property, the John William Roadbeck property, uh, 
exercise option to purchase the property of Tim Brennan, uh, Brenneman and Mrs. Brenneman, I take it, or Brenda Brenneman, so I assume there. Uh, request approval for the FY22 annual transportation plan. Uh, yep. And let's see. That's about it. And Commissioner Wance, I'm really looking forward to the 21st where he will have the podcast. That's around St. Patrick's Day, so hang on. <laughs> it could be very, very entertaining. No comment. Okay. <laughs> I just don't want to go there. Um, and I'm not going to pinch you either. So, <laughs> anything else for the good of the group? We do have admin, I believe, after this. Uh, just regular admin. So, stay fast after we close. Do I have a motion to close? Motion to adjourn. Or That's right. To adjourn. I apologize. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, I got a motion and a second. Any discussion on that? Absolutely none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Come on now. Where's Come Lance? on. Okay, 4-1.